Using photoacoustics, we advanced the penetration by nearly two orders of magnitude. Now we're talking about multiple centimeters of tissue penetration. Of course, we do face the next challenge. Which, which technology can overcome the next challenge is still open question. Today I'll focus on photoacoustics. In photoacoustics CT, we start with a broad laser beam um, such that the uh, energy per area is within the safety limit. And we do use a very short laser pulse to generate very broadband photoacoustic signals. When light is absorbed, it generates very rapid heating. Every milli-degree gives you 800 pascals of pressure, which is detectable already. But within the safety limit, you can generate hundreds of milli-degrees. Therefore, you have a good signal-to-noise ratio to work with. Unlike standard optical imaging, we don't detect returned photons. We detect the emitted photons. Because ultrasound scattering is orders of magnitude weaker than optical scattering, we can form a very sharp image by using the waves. Therefore, we combine optical contrast with ultrasonic resolution in a single modality. We do have to use math to form an image, which is why we're talking here at ICCP. In fact, we solve this inverse focal radon transform. It's a little different from X3CT, which deals with inverse linear radon transform. So we have one extra dimension, we deal with a, with a curved surface. And so radon never really inverted this problem, we're, even though we're naming this after him. If you have a 3D unknown object, you fire a short laser pulse, instantaneously generate a volumetric acoustic source. You know, the forward problem is essentially a radon transform over this spherical surface. And V is the speed of sound and T is the time of arrival. And of course, we need to invert this problem to form a volumetric image. So the equation is actually pretty straightforward in the ideal situation. If the acoustic medium has a homogeneous acoustic speed, and then you can exactly invert this problem. And P is the pressure we detect at detector position R0 as a function of time T. Again, this is another difference from X-ray CT because X-ray CT does not have a sufficient temporal resolution. And so we get an extra dimension. So that means we don't have to scan as hard. In X-ray CT, as we know, we need to do maybe a linear scan, then followed by different rotations. Here we don't. We, with a fixed array, if you surround the tissue, you don't have to scan because you got an extra time dimension. And then um, using this equation, you can form an uh, image of the acoustic source. P0 is the source induced by the laser absorption inside the tissue. Although this is, at first glance, this looks like a mechanical contrast, but this property P0 is proportional to light absorption. Therefore, we measure the absorption coefficient. Sometimes we call that mu A. And we use a solid angle to, um, uh, to unify all different detection geometries. So this is called the universal back projection method. And you do have to deal with the time delay. Uh, this is essentially a time reversal process because in the forward problem, your signal propagates over a given time frame. And if you use the first term, that's very similar to the standard ultrasound beamforming, but if you include this high frequency term, you form an exact solution. And so this is one of the most widely used algorithms in our field. In 2003, we demonstrated the first functional, also the first in vivo photoacoustic tomographic images in small animals with an intact scalp and skull. And you can see one-sided brain activate as we activate, as we uh, wiggle the whiskers of a small animal. And so this paper has initiated uh, exponential growth of our field. This is one of the two most cited papers in our field now. And you can see the growth of the field um, is exponential growth. Since 2010, the conference on photoacoustics has become the largest at Photonics West. And we're actually seeing this pandemic dip. Hopefully, we'll pull out very soon. And now the field uh, publishes over 1,000 peer reviewed papers per year. And so it's a very robust field. And the technology has been commercialized by more than 20 companies. And in fact, one of the companies has received FDA approval for a human breast imaging. In 2017, we finally built a, what I call a dream machine at the time. And so for the 03 work, we used a single element transducer that took about 20 minutes to acquire image. And now with a single shot, within tens of microseconds, we can acquire image. So it's many orders of magnitude faster now. Uh, so for trunk imaging, we start with the laser beam and use a conical lens to form a hollow cone beam to optimal light delivery with a minimal energy loss. And we use a four ring transducer to form a full view. We call that a panoramic view uh, for 2D imaging. 
And then we follow the Nyquist sampling criterion to uh, minimize any uh, uh, subsampling artifact or aliasing artifact. We use preamplifiers to maximize the signal to noise ratio. We use one-to-one -one data acquisition, so we use 512 channels of data acquisition for a single shot imaging. The, the data acquisition, acquisition time is limited by the acoustic transit time across the field, which is tens of microseconds for a small animal. We use a computer to form an image and present an image. And here's a close-up, you got this hollow cone beam, and you got ultrasonic focus for elevational resolution, then you have inverse read-on transform for XY resolution. And we can reconfigure the system easily for brain imaging. Here we use a diffuser to form a solid cone beam for maximum light delivery, and the rest of the system is very much the same. And I'll just show you one movie where we can uh, scan along the trunk of this animal for whole body imaging. And you can see detailed structures without injecting any exogenous contrast agent. Here's a close-up showing different organs. And we can repeat the laser for different frames. So here the laser rep rate is 50 hertz. That's why you're seeing 50 hertz frame rate. And, but if you uh, fire, the laser rep rate, uh, fire the lasers at a higher rate, then you can image it faster as well. So this technology has been licensed to a company. They are actually producing better images than our original version, as you can see right here. And you can also introduce exogenous contrast. And by tuning the laser wavelength, you can see the exogenous contrast as well. So of course, we decided to scale up the system for human breast imaging. Um, so all we have to do is to um, adjust ultrasound frequency properly so we can provide deeper penetration. And of course, the diameter of the system has to be bigger to accommodate most breasts. And so this uh, 22 centimeter diameter system allows us to accommodate uh, more than 95% of the human breast. And you can slice it deform without causing any pain to less than four centimeters in thickness. And Photoacoustics is multi-scale, and this is a plot of imaging depth versus spatial resolution. This dashed line connects all the different realizations of photoacoustics, and so the system I just uh, shown uh, works around this corner. It provides multiple centimeters of penetration, hundreds of microns resolution. And this is one of the images acquired from a healthy volunteer, and that's the nipple region. With a single shot, within 150 microseconds, you can get a 2D cross-sectional image, and we can uh, scan the entire breast within a single breath hole to minimize any breathing-induced artifacts. The smallest vessel diameter we can image is about a quarter of a millimeter, and uh, we can penetrate uh, roughly four centimeters, as shown by different cross-sectional images. And this is an example where we can see a tumor, which is a radiographically dense breast. X-ray actually missed the tumor, but we can see the tumor beautifully because of angiogenesis. You can see this dense collection of blood vessels, and later on we can compute the vessel density, and that confirms this uh, density difference as well. Because we can image so fast, we can track the changes that allows us to figure out the stiffness of the tumor. You can see this tumor region is stiffer than the surrounding normal tissue. And this is a very recent image, it's unpublished yet. Um, so we compare our imaging modality with the FDA approved version. And this is a handhold probe, it doesn't really show you much detail. And we, our image uh, shows greater details of the blood vessels. And so this should beat the FDA approved system in terms of the sensitivity and hopefully specificity as well. And we also compare with the standard MRI, which requires, requires gadolinium ex exogenous contrast agent injection. As we know, that's a heavy metal type of contrast agent. It has some side effect. And we don't inject any contrast agent. Um, you can see that we can match some of the vessels we image. Uh, we can see additional vessels. Uh, the prime numbers indicate additional vessels we see. All of those vessels are feeding this tumor, and this is a known hallmark of cancer because cancers grow so fast, they require a lot of nutrients, so you have to grow a lot of vessels to feed that tumor. And we also decided to uh, change the system to provide isotropic resolution in 3D and uh, go for human imaging. So this system uh, was doubled for brain and breast imaging. And so I'll skip some of the details, um, but this is, has more channels. And you can see this uh, beautiful 3D image of a breast and see detailed blood vessel structures. And then we moved on to human brain imaging. We started with patients with hemicranianomy. Um, so their, their skull bone was temporarily removed. Uh, you can see here, as uh, we asked the subject to tap fingers, the brain was activated. Uh, you will see this activation shown right here. 
you see this red dot right here, and that's brain activation. So we're detecting functional changes very similar to functional MRI. Here we present results from subject one, 7T MRI on the left, functional pact on the right. Individual functions are flashed in, starting with finger tapping, lip puckering, tongue tapping, passive listening, and silent word generation. Vessels for co-registration are then labeled one through four, vessel one and two being superficial temporal artery, three and four being cortical arteries. The images are overlaid, and then individual functions are flashed in, starting with finger tapping, lip puckering, tongue tapping, passive listening, and silent word generation. The vessels are again pointed out individually, vessel one and two being branches of the superficial temporal artery, three and four being cortical vessels. The lateral perturbations allow for visual spatial appreciation of the co-registration. The images are then separated and native T1 masks are faded in. Again, 7T MRI on the left, functional pact on the right. Individual functions are then flashed in, starting with finger tapping, axial, and coronal images through the area of interest are introduced below. Next, lip puckering, tongue tapping, passive listening, and silent word generation. Right, so I mean, there is functional MRI. Why do we need uh, functional PACT? Um, so if you compare with uh, functional MRI, photoacoustics provides more contrast mechanisms, faster response, lower background, higher linearity, uh, much greater portability, open platform, lower acoustic noise, much lower cost, and magnet-free. So of course, photoacoustics is multi-scale, so we can scale the system for microscopic imaging. Uh, here is a demonstration of in vivo imaging in a real life patient, uh, a single circulating tumor cell, where we start with melanoma circulating tumor cells. Within the field of view, you can see this dot, bright dot. By tuning the laser wavelength, mel melanin becomes much higher absorbing than even the rest of the blood, so they just jump out. And in this particular case, you can see double, a doublet flowing across the field of view. And we can capture that multiple times uh, at our current frame rate. So you can imagine all sorts of applications. The other application is pathology. The standard pathology for a lot of applications are not good enough for intraoperative application. For example, for breast tissue, it's fatty, so fro frozen section it may not work so well. It's hard to freeze fatty tissue. And so as a result, a lot of patients have to come back for a second surgery because the first time we do not, we do not remove all the cancer cells. Using photoacoustics, we can provide label-free imaging, even for bone tissue, which requires up to seven days to complete you know, at least one day. And so using our technique, we can do it within minutes. So this provides opportunity for intraoperative diagnosis where you can cut uh, the bone tissue. And in fact, for bone, it, because bone is so hard to grow, uh, to grow, it's very important to preserve healthy bone tissue. Uh, the standard practice right now requires a two centimeter margin. We can shrink that margin by a factor of 10 to two millimeters. You can see how, how much bone tissue we can save. So what we did was we tuned the laser wavelength such that the NRA becomes absorbing, so we achieve HE equivalent imaging. And to close, let me uh, thank Caltech for building me a dream lab, and this is one of the floors of our lab. Um, in fact, we're gonna have uh, lab tours. Uh, Peng Wang, or, or Peng, are you here? Would you stand up? so people can recognize you. So Peng is gonna organize uh, lab tours for our lab. And so during the coffee break, would you come to the front so people can easily find you? Yeah. And so if you're, if you're interested in a lab tour, please talk to Peng. Uh, we can accommodate maybe uh, during the lunch break or at, at the end of the day as well, after 5.30 when the meeting closes.
So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Wang, for such an amazing talk. Uh, it's nice to see everything becoming super fast. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, while you guys are lining up, I have a couple of questions of mine. Sure. So yes. in the impulse uh, of photographic tomography, you mentioned that mm -hmm. uh, the speed is actually limited by the repetition rate of the laser, which is like 50 hertz in your particular case. I was wondering, uh, is there any other limit? Because you know we can use like a mode lock laser, go all the way up to 80 megahertz. Um, does that mean that we can do fMRI at 80 megahertz, or is it something that limits us to a lower speed? Right. Uh, very good. Very good question. So, the, for each frame, the data acquisition is limited by the acoustic transit time across the field of view. But that's just one frame. Now, if you surround the entire tissue um, over a 2D spherical surface with a single laser shot, in theory, you can generate a single shot 3D image. Now, the next frame has to come from the next laser pulse. So you do have to repeat the laser pulse. There are two ANSI safety limits. One is for each laser shot. For example, at 1064 nanometers, you have to have uh, less than 100 millijoules per centimeter squared surface uh, radian uh, radiant exposure. Uh, when you repeat laser pulses, if you do it over 10 seconds or longer, you have to conform to a second limit, you know, which is given in milliwatts per centimeter squared. So if you hold a single shot NC limit, you're, you're only allowed to fire at 10 hertz. All right, so if you want to fire higher than 10 hertz, you ha the limiting factor is coming from the second limit. So that means you, ha you have to reduce the single shot exposure. Okay. And so that means when you use less light, maybe the deeper vessels will become less clear. So there is a, there's a trade-off you have to play with. There are other ways to do it. If you want to examine different regions, each laser shot is only ex exposes a small subregion and then you move your next laser to a different region, I think we can bypass the ANC limit because you're not exposed in the same area. Because ANC wants to make sure you don't accumulate heat when you fire rapidly. Because you can accumulate heat, you can still burn the tissue. I see, awesome, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, I just want to ask a follow-up question on that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also travel time uh, because the sound has to travel back to the uh, receivers and also mm -hmm, the light mm -hmm. has to travel. Mm -hmm. Light ratio mm -hmm. is super fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, would the speed of sound also impose a limit on how fast you can repeat? Because uh, there is a, that's a, another very good point. Um, so you want once you fire the laser shot, you want to wait for the acoustic wave to clear out of the volume before you fire the next one, unless you use some tricks to make sure they look different. Oh. You know, you can modulate it some some way, or you can invert a phase, or do whatever. You know. There are ways to do that. In fact, uh, the people have worked on that. So for a microscopic imaging, usually it's not an issue. But for a microscopic imaging, you want to fire really, really fast. And then uh, you may have to consider that. Mm -hmm. You know, for microscopic imaging, you can go up to like a megahertz mm -hmm. frame rate. You know, beyond that, then the, the acoustic signals will start to overlap. Awesome. Yeah. That then you then you got to tease them out somehow. You know. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, my question was, are you limited by the penetration depth of the laser? How deep can you go and how do you think you could improve that? Yes, we are limited by the light penetration. Um, so the reason that we broke through the optical diffusion limit is because we actually use scatter light. So if you look at the confocal, two photon microscopy, optical coherence tomography, they're all limited by the ballistic traveling photons. You know, they only select photons that go straight. You know, the diffuse photons will not provide spatial resolution. Photoacoustics says we allow photons to wander around because this type of photons can go much, much deeper. And so the resolution comes from the acoustic detection. And so the optical excitation part does not provide spatial resolution. And, but even the diffuse photons will have a limit. So currently we can demonstrate in vivo up to about four centimeters. And there's a group, uh, a Dutch group, they recently demonstrated about five centimeters in human breast. So by using optimal wavelength, there's more room to improve. And we're not using the maximum light delivery yet. And also the NC safety limit is extremely conservative. Uh, so it's at least 10 times below the damage threshold. And so there could be some room if we one day convince FDA or NC that for patients, because we're benefiting patient, you know, we may be allowed to go a little higher, 
and that will allow us to image deeper. And uh, the depth I quoted is for a single laser shot. So as you know, this is all SNR limited. And so if you're, you know, because you're only imaging, you know, uh, at 10 hertz frame rate. Uh, so if you're allowed to image longer with 100 shots, you can improve the SNR roughly by square root of 100, and as a matter of fact of 10. So for every factor of 10, you can potentially image at least one centimeter deeper. Uh, so in the number we quoted is also not at optimal wavelength. So by optimizing the wavelength, longer image acquisition, uh, you can image deeper. Now, unlike X-ray, which goes straight, so you, you always work in transmission mode. The acoustic wave goes in all directions. And so for tissue, you can deliver light from both sides. So you can double the thickness you can image. So if it's four to five centimeters, you double, then becomes eight to 10 centimeters in thickness. So there are multiple ways of uh, improving that. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, we have time for one more question, and I'm sure. waiting this time just so that I can ask you more questions. Sure. Uh, it might be a bit unfair question, but uh, something that might benefit our community. Um, uh, uh, Imaging through scattering media, at least in computational photography community in this conference, we have many papers on underwater imaging or imaging through fog, mm -hmm. where we want to reconstruct like surfaces uh, that are inside this fog medium. Uh, I was, want to hear your thoughts on how probably photoacoustic uh, effect can be used to image these kind of things. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's a bit unfair because you're doing volumetric uh, imaging, but I was asking about uh, surfaces which are inside the scattering medium. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, so. Even though photoacoustics was primarily developed for tissue imaging, tissue is a, is a really badly scattering medium, right? So it's a scattering medium. Anything scattering uh, can potentially benefit from photoacoustic imaging. And so the principle is pretty much the same. So you, as long as you have light absorption, um, you can generate acoustic signals. It doesn't matter whether it goes through biological tissue or goes through a fog or clouds, or whatever. As long as you can receive the signals, you can form an image. And so underwater, you know, that's a very natural application as well. You might be able to detect a leaking oil that has no sonar contrast, right? But it has tremendous, you know, optical contrast. Um, you know, it just, while we're here, another way to extend the optical regime is to go to a microwave or, you know, where you can provide much deeper penetration. So if there are other EM contrast, you can also use the same principle. So amazing. Uh I have, I think we have one more question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk and Thank also you. the success for these technologies for the bioimaging. And in aerospace, for the composite manufacturing, there's a laser ultrasound. So I'm curious for your uh, setup, can they just be used directly for that, uh, the composite detection to detect the denominations issues? I think, uh, so photoacoustics actually started um, you know, for quite some time. Um, the, the field started for mostly 2D imaging, you know, surface imaging or subsurface imaging, uh, but not for full 3D. That's why the algorithm was developed uh, primarily for biological tissue once we have 3D penetration. So they can potentially modify their system for this type of imaging, you know, even though they didn't plan to do that to begin with. Um, it, it is entirely possible, yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, this technology is so good, and why for laser ultrasound has been has not been as successful as, uh, for using in the aerospace uh, those composite detection? Right. One is one is the the um, the spatial diversity. So we use a lot of elements. You know, we use hundreds of detector positions or hundreds of detectors. Uh, for 3D imaging, we're using thousands, even tens of thousands virtual detector positions to form a sharp image. The other is the image reconstruction method I mentioned. So you do have to reconstruct it to form a sharp image. The inverse vertical radon transform is one way. And another important aspect to this community is we require more sophisticated computation. And we started with hemicraniotomy patients, and we're obviously moving on to imaging through intact skull. So the skull is acoustically heterogeneous relative to the rest of the soft tissue. And we have to take that into account. We have to de-aberrate because the skull is gonna cause wave front aberration. We, have, we need to de-aberrate to sharpen the image. And so there's a lot of computing going on. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, sorry, we are out of time. Uh, okay. So let us thank once again Professor Li Hong Wong for such an amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, um, speaker, uh, first, sorry, first paper session of the day, um, session five. We're gonna have four really interesting talks, um, ranging from microscopy to style transfer to using ultrasound to form lenses. So our first, uh, our first presentation is gonna be computational imaging using ultrasonically sculpted virtual waveguides. Speaker is Hussein Bakash, so go ahead and take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Hossein Baktosh and I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. And today I'll be talking about how we used ultrasonically sculpted virtual waveguides to do computational imaging. So first I'll start by explaining how we use uh, these kind of waveguides. So assume that we have a piezoelectric transducer in some medium, let's say water. Uh, once we apply voltage to this transducer, it starts vibrating. And this vibration creates pressure waves in that medium and the pressure wave uh, changes the density of the medium and it translates to changing the refractive index. And if you look at a high refractive index region, such as this, and we send an input beam of light, uh, what we see is that light gets confined uh, in that region, and not just confined, it gets focused in this region. So basically these uh, virtual waveguides work as a kind of lens. And this idea inspired uh, this nice paper by Scobliti and colleagues from our lab, where they use the cylindrical transducer as their input uh, pressure source. And uh, they place this transducer in water, and they placed an imaging target on the bottom of the transducer. And an external imaging system was focused on top of the transducer uh, to see the lensing effect. And basically this uh, transducer, which we will call the ultrasonic lens, uh, was used to relay images. So for example, when the ultrasound was turned off, uh, you see a lensless, lensless image here, and uh, when it was turned on, we could see that the image on the bottom was relayed uh, using this ultrasonic lens. And uh, I have another image to show here. This is a larger target. Uh, we place this under the ultrasonic lens, and uh, we can see the relayed image here. And uh, there is uh, another thing that we can do with these lenses. For example, we can increase and decrease the voltage to change the focal plane uh, of our lens. And that gives us a reconfigurability for these kind of lenses. So what I will talk about today is that, first of all, this reconfigurability is not limited to just changing the focal distance. Uh, we can actually sculpt much more complex lenses uh, using our transducers and a technique that I will talk about. And uh, they can give us very, very complex patterns. And I will use one of these patterns uh, to do imaging. And uh, what we will see is that these lenses suffer from uh, a little bit of aberration. And uh, because we have an accurate model of these lenses, we can actually deblur these images. Uh, okay, so first I'll start off by uh, one of the images that we saw before. Here's a a uh, simulated image, we used uh, a render developed by uh, Pedredla and colleagues to simulate our lenses. Um, as you can see, the image is uh, suffering from some blur. Uh, to model this blur, we sample point sources at different locations of the field of view. And as you can see here, the PSFs are especially varying. And if we sample enough PSFs at different locations, we can build the blur operator and we can use that to deblur the images. And as we can see, we have a nice deblurred image here. And uh, this technique works, but it's uh, computationally intensive and our PSF sizes kind of get large, especially in the off-center areas. And uh, that makes this process a little tricky. And, uh, but the thing is, this is not the only thing that we can do using these transducers. Uh, there's this nice, work by Karimi and colleagues from our lab, where they segmented the transducer, uh, like this image that we see here, 
and each segment uh, was operated independently from the other segments. And using that, for example, if we operate all segments in, in phase with each other, then uh, we get the spatial pattern that we had before, and uh, we get the same lens, same lens as we had before. And if we change the phase arrangement of these segments, for example, like this, we get a whole new pattern, and uh, this new pattern, which we will call mode one, gives us an interesting optical focus, for example, like this. And uh, by rotating this phase arrangement, we can rotate this pattern uh, in real time and electronically. And uh, for example, here's another phase arrangement, which gives us this quadruple uh, mode. We will call this mode two. And the kind of focus that this mode gives us uh, is this kind of line focus. And uh, we will see why this line focus is, is interesting later. And again, we can rotate this pattern, again, by rotating the phase arrangement. And uh, this can be done really fast and in real time. And as you notice here, we can only rotate it by 45 degrees uh, using this eight segment transducer. If you have more segments, which can be done uh, easily, then we can make the rotation done uh, much smoother. And, uh, and there are more patterns possible, for example, something like this, even with our eight segment transducer, but we will not get into that. And again, the cool thing about these patterns is that we can reconfigure them in real time. So uh, we are particularly interested in this mode two pattern because it gives us a line focus and it would probably give us a line integral uh, of some imaging target. Uh, so we can go on and place our target underneath this ultrasonic lens. Uh, if we have a look at a larger field of view, we see an image like this forming, which, which kind of looks like uh, the image has been stretched in one direction. And if you have a closer look, uh, we can see that actually this, this, these lines ha have preserved some of the uh, texture of the input target. And, uh, and so if this is taking a line integral for us, then we can go on and do radon transform uh, with this type of lens. So as you can see here, here we rotate the target and take more two measurements at the same time. And uh, I'm also showing the true radon image on top. As we can see, the mode two measurements almost match the true radon image. And to assert that, we can uh, simply do inverse radon transform on this mode two image, on these mode two measurements. And we can see a nice reconstruction uh, of the image that we had. So, uh, this, this shows that our, our ultrasonic lens in mode two takes line integrals uh, of the target. So let's have a look at the PSFs that mode two provide for us. As we expect, the PSFs don't change when we move them vertically, uh, but they change when, when we move them horizontally. And uh, the image that we saw in the earlier slide was slightly blurry, and probably the cause is that our line integrator is blurry in one, and uh, it can only be blurry in one direction. And that's all right, because uh, we can deblur this very easily. Uh, for example, here's the set of measurements that we had from before, and the reconstructed image. Uh, using the PSFs that I showed in the previous slide, we can build the blur operator, and we can deblur these more two measurements in our uh, in our radon image, and we can get a sharper radon image. And once we do inverse radon on this sharper image, we get a, a better reconstruction with higher SNR. And the cool thing here is that this deblurring process can be done much faster than what we had in mode zero, because our blur here is only one dimensional, and no matter how uh, how wide our kernels are and uh, and uh, regardless of the fact that they are spatially varying, we can do this deblurring process very efficiently. And uh, so we went on and implemented this in our uh, real setup. Uh, we placed a transducer array in water, and you see the red wires coming out, which is each wire is used to uh, control each of the segments. And uh, we use an external imaging system to see the image that is formed by our ultrasonic lens. Uh, on the bottom of the transducer, we placed 
our uh, imaging target, and we place it on a rotation stage uh, to rotate it mechanically, but as we saw before, we can do this rotation electronically if we have a transducer with uh, a decent number of segments. Uh, so using this setup, we record, uh, we uh, collected a set of measurements. Here's a real target, and here are the measurements of our mode two setup. And uh, after deep learning and uh, reconstructing the image, we get uh, images like this. Uh, here's another target. This is a mouse brain slice. And uh, here are some other targets. So this is great, and uh, it works very well uh, in experiments and in simulations. And uh, we can have a little comparison of mode zero and mode two. Uh, well, first of all, mode two has a is much more uh, is much more uh, computationally efficient, and uh, in most cases, mode two outperforms mode zero in terms of SNR. And beyond that, in noisy conditions, mode two outperforms mode zero. Uh, for example, here's a reconstruction of mode zero and mode two in low noise levels, and in higher noise levels, we can see that mode zero degrades while mode two gives us a decent image. And, uh, and so with that, I would like to encourage everyone to uh, think about these kind of lenses. They give us a rich design to implement uh, different operators, like the one we saw with mode two. And uh, we can go beyond that and we can make much, much more complex uh, lenses. I talked about electronically changing the patterns and uh, uh, which is really fast, but for example, here uh, is a pattern which is a transient, basically. I'm not changing anything, and by selecting the correct frequency, uh, the pattern changes by itself over time. And uh, I would encourage everyone to think about the possible applications in imaging and even beyond imaging. And uh, with that, I would like to thank my colleagues and supporters, and. Uh, Thank you for listening. Okay, very cool talk. Um, we have uh, a good amount of time for questions, so why don't you go ahead. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I wonder what limits your signal-to-noise ratio? Excuse me? Your SNR you showed um, mm -hmm. is up to like, you know, I don't know, less than 10, right? So. What would you do to improve the signal-to-noise ratio, SNR? Mm -hmm. So we used L2 priors to rebuild, reconstruct the images. Uh, we can use other priors, like uh, TV priors, and uh, that kind of improves the SNR. And also, uh, we can always have more angles in mode 2, especially uh, to have a better reconstruction. And also, uh, for example, in mode 0, uh, we built the PSFs using, we had a limited number of PSFs and we interpolated the whole blur operator. We can have a denser sampling and that would improve the SNR. What's your typical diffraction efficiency? Excuse me? How much light is diffracted due to ultrasound? Uh, uh, we did not study that. I actually wonder whether that's an area of improvement. You know the, the Raman Nath regime of acoustic optics versus the Bragg regime? Mm -hmm. The Bragg regime can have extremely high efficiency uh -huh. because they simply use a thicker acoustic lens, so to speak. Right? It's, a phase, it's basically a phase grating. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Uh, yeah, th that, that sounds interesting, but uh, I don't know. That. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what limits you to only being able to achieve 45 degree uh, shifts? Are you only using integer values for uh, the phase difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So there are a couple of things that we can do to accommodate for that limitation. For example, instead of that kind of integer reassignment, uh, we can slightly change the phase. For example, we use 0 and 180 degrees in different elements. If you slightly change the phase, uh, then you get a slight tilt in the line, and that can give you a higher kind of angular resolution. So can you achieve, uh, can you achieve uh, continuous uh, rotation in that manner? Uh, yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah. 
Hey, great talk. Um, so mode two is kind of like a little line integral scan. You show that you sort of radon transform it back into an image. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that if you had like a, I don't know, like a 32 bit transducer array of you just had hundreds of those things. Mm -hmm. um, could you start doing something like, uh, like you take a mode three scan and a mode mm -hmm. 17 and a mode no, 176, and then you start trying to fuse all of these different sort of, I guess, wacky line integrals together into one mm -hmm. big super resolved thing? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. That's something that we have explored. We didn't, we didn't do that in this paper, but uh, that's a great idea. For example, uh, here, a set of mode one PSFs, they give us a totally different type of PSFs, and uh, we have explored that combining these with, for example, mode, one, mode zero gives us a, a much better SNR and a much better reconstruction. So the more modes that you have, the more uh, kind of measurements that you have, uh, you can combine all of these because we have accurate models, and uh, yeah, that is, that's a good idea. That's exactly right. Cool, awesome. I uh, can't yeah. wait to see that. Okay, uh, unfortunately, near Joe Cyrus, we move on to the next speaker. Uh, so let's thank the speaker one last thank time. You. It was a great talk. Oh, oh mask. Here's your mask. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, okay, uh, up next, uh, we have a work called Dynamic Structured Illumination Microscopy with a Neural Space Time Model. Um, this is work from UC Berkeley. Um, the presenter will be Ruming Kao. Um, so once you're ready, go ahead and take it away. One sec. Uh, all right, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Ruming Cao. I'm a graduate student from uh, Professor Laura Waller's group at UC Berkeley. Uh, so I'll present our work doing uh, structured illumination <laughs> microscopy for dynamic sample super resolution using a neural space time model. So I'll start with an introduction of diffraction limited resolution. The spatial resolution of any optical system is limited by the light diffraction and the resolution is determined by the wavelengths of the light and the numerical aperture NA of the optical system. As shown in this example, a high resolution sample is blurred after passing through the diffraction limited system. And if we sync the sample in the Fourier space, as illustrated here by those three signals, the signal will be low pass filtered and only the low frequency signal can be measured. And the structured illumination microscopy or SIM is a class of methods uh, to see beyond the diffraction limit. The SIM uses pattern sinusoidal illumination to encode the high frequency information into the Moyer patterns. And uh, similarly, in the Fourier space, the sinusoidal illumination becomes two delta function peaks, and it convolves with the sample before going into the low pass filter. And the convolution shifts the spatial frequency of the sample and enabling the observation beyond the diffraction limit. And by combining the multiple diffraction limited measurements, we can observe a super resolved image. And the bandwidth of the sinusoidal uh, sim combines the objectives and the illuminations NA and usually evolves two times super resolution than the diffraction limit. And uh, although the, sin, uh, the, the SIM is most commonly with sinusoidal illumination, it can also be implemented using the random speckle illumination. We call it a speckle SIM. And the speckle illumination is obtained by a plane wave passing through a random fa face object, like a diffuser. And the speckle SIM also modulates the high frequency info into low frequency observations. And in Fourier space, the speckle illumination becomes some random kernel bounded by the NA of the speckle. And during the forward process, the object is convolved with the speckle before uh, going into the low pass filter. And we also have to collect multiple raw images to recover a super resolved reconstruction. And the spatial bandwidth of the speckle sim is also around two times of the diffraction limit. 
And um, as hinted earlier, uh, both methods require taking uh, multiple raw uh, images using different pattern illumination to get the diversified uh, measurements for well post uh, super resolution reconstruction. And the sinusoidal system uh, varies the illumination by either rotating the diffraction grating or using a special light modulator. And then the, the speckle system is even simpler in its uh, illumination setup. We can either rotate or laterally shift the diffuser to generate a new speckle. Because of their multi-shot nature, uh, SIM trace off some uh, temporal resolution for a higher spatial resolution, and making it uh, kind of unsuitable for dynamic samples. And uh, the previous SIM methods update the pattern illumination all the time so that we don't just measure the, the same thing at different exposure times. However, if we consider that the sample itself is also moving, we can get diversified measurement even when the uh, illumination is fixed. And uh, in the example shown here, uh, we use the illumination, uh, fixed illumination to image the dynamic scene um, with an object moving around. And as the object moves, we can see changes in the acquired uh, images. And here, our method called uh, speckle flow scene uh, aims to super resolve each frame of the dynamic scene from the acquired raw images. And the fixed uh, speckle illumination has two hidden benefits. First is that it makes our experimental setup very simple, without using any moving parts or a spatial light modulator. And the second is that uh, the previous speckle sim studies always consider the speckle to be uh, somewhat random, and very little knowledge can be really assumed for the speckle illumination as a result, and making the speckle sim uh, data inefficient compared with the regular sinusoidal sim. And as we fix the speckle here, we, we can now pre-calibrate for the speckle illumination, and we can learn the structure illumination patterns before the actual imaging, like, like we always do in the sinusoidal scene. And then the reconstruction can also be more data efficient. And uh, even with the full knowledge of the speckle, this is still not enough to recover the whole dynamic super resolved scene. This is because for each frame, the acquired image bandwidth is still two times smaller than the super resolved resolution bandwidth we, we, we try to get. And we still need to have additional knowledge or constraint to make the speckle flow seem really feasible. And our answer is to exploit the temporal redundancy of the motion dynamics. And here is a video of a freely moving sea elegance. If you play the video frame by frame, we can see the scene barely changes across those uh, adjacent time points. And this temporal redundancy has been commonly used in video compression, uh, such that like once we know one frame, we only need to store the difference or the delta between its adjacent frames in order to replay them. And uh, back to the example, looking into those adjacent frames, if we know the motion kernel, we may obtain a frame by applying the motion kernel to the reference frame. And therefore, we can represent the whole dynamic scene by using uh, one static scene and different motion kernels corresponding to the time points. And in practice, we use the so-called coordinate-based neural network or coordinate-based uh, multilayer perceptron, MLP, to store the motion kernels. Coordinate MLP is a compressive representation to explore uh, the temporal redundancy. And for an arbitrary pixel of the scene at the given time point, we can write out its space-time coordinate. And then we feed this coordinate into the motion MLP which will estimate its xy displacement. And we repeat this process on all pixels at the time point, and we will get an estimated motion kernel for the whole scene. And since the, this motion estimation is at the pixel level, it will be able to represent arbitrary deformable motion. And once we have the motion kernel estimated from the motion MLP, we will have another MLP, we call it scene MLP, to reproduce the reference super resolved scene from the input spatial coordinate. The scene MLP is independent to time, and we get the motion counted spatial coordinate from the motion MLP and feed it into the scene MLP to retrieve the frame of the dynamic scene. 
And putting the motion and CNMLPs together, we have the neural space-time model, which serves as the backbone of the speckle flow scene. And now the dynamic scene is fully represented by the neural space-time model, which stores all, all the knowledge in the ways of the two MLPs. And during the reconstruction, we first obtained the reconstructed scene from the neural space-time model, and then it's, it, it's fed into the forward physical model to get the simulated or rendered image. We compute the L2 loss between the simulated and the acquired image and update the network weights using gradient descent. And uh, to validate the speckle float scene, we first perform a simulation study using a Hydra video. The first column is the raw images that our system can measure. The trajectory in the second column are for the estimated motion of those uh, selected pixels. And then the last two columns are the reconstruction of the ground truth phase. And this Hydra example shows that the motion MLP can fully accommodate for deformable motion. And we also compare the reconstruction with a different number of input frames. Here shows the reconstruction of the Shep Logan phantom in the phase channel. As shown here on the left, when only very few frames are used, we won't have sufficient information to really resolve the super resolution. But then on the other hand, if we use too many frames, the motion MLP will have to estimate for longer motion. And when the motion MLP is at its limit, it does not estimate the motion precisely, and then the reconstruction quality will also be affected. Therefore, we need to choose the proper number of frames to get the optimal result. And other than the number of frames, we want to note that the reconstruction also depends on the motion. Here we perform another simulation study with absorptive USAF resolution target. We simulate different types of motion during the acquisition as shown on the row below, and then the reconstructed results are shown on the top. As hinted in the previous slide, the reconstruction quality is clearly motion dependent, and since it's harder for the motion MLP to precisely fit into a highly deformable motion, the reconstruction quality also tends to become worse. And here we show our experimental result. We built an experimental system and image the USAF resolution target placed on a single axis motion stage. We acquire a sequence of raw images while the sample was moving continuously on the lateral directions. And those raw images are shown on the left. And then we perform a dynamic scene reconstruction using the neural space-time model, and the recovery scene is shown in the middle. Compared with the diffraction-limited image, the speckle float scene achieves uh, 1.88 times super resolution without any sacrifice of its uh, temporal resolution as like all the other scene methods will probably have. And uh, in, in summary, uh, we propose a new SIMP method called uh, spec of float scene uh, to resolve this, uh, to super resolve a dynamic scene with a fixed spec of illumination. And we use the neural space time model to exploit the temporal redundancy. And the spec of float scene is compatible with deformable motion. And we also experimentally uh, shows that uh, uh, 1.88 times super resolution using a simple inexpensive setup. And uh, please feel free to read our paper and our code and data will be made available very soon. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, okay, great talk. Uh, we have about three minutes for questions. So if anyone has anything, you uh, can head on up to the mic. Um, okay, I see we got some people in coming. So. Thank you for the talk. Um, do you enforce any smoothness or prior on the output motion vector field? So, so the prior, the I would say the the network itself, like the MLP itself, is the prior, and uh, we we haven't enforced any other explicit prior on the loss function or so. 
Right, so if you look at the vector field, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be changing in a smooth way. Yeah, that, 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 that is correct. It's really implicitly uh, enforced. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, great work. Uh, it's a very similar question, actually. So you don't enforce any loss function on the output of the motion MLP. It just um, like naturally learns this uh, decoupling of motion and scene into these two networks? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we don't enforce any. The, the loss function is just the L2 loss. And in the experimental data, we, we also like uh, have a so-called high frequency loss to rule off those uh, like uh, re reconstruction outside beyond the theoretical limit just to for the denoising purpose. But in the simulation, we don't enforce any like explicit uh, loss function on the mm, like on, on the motion or so. So it's just a L2 loss on the measurements. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Hi, a uh, very interesting talk. Um, have you tried the same method with sinusoid high frequency illumination? And will that be able to handle more complex uh, motion? Yeah, th thanks for the question. So uh, we haven't uh, practiced this, uh, we haven't tried this method on the sinusoidal illumination, but uh, the intuition of using uh, speckle illumination is that, so that we don't need to uh, vary the illumination all the time. So if using the sinusoidal illumination, I guess we still need to vary the illumination so that we can measure all the frequency space. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for one more quick question. Yeah. Uh, have you tried this method without the speckle, just using simple alias uh, signals, for example, from a regular uh, camera? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, Do you that think could it be can work in that case? Uh, you, you mean like uh, ju just to use the the motion prior, like, like or the right. uh, temper on the regular image. So we had like a separate study using that on the diffuser cam, which is uh, like slightly closer to a regular camera, and uh, yeah, it, it can like generate maybe like uh, do the smoother reconstruction. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I I don't know much about that actually. It's not my study. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, great. Uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you, Ruming. Um, okay. All right, uh, our third talk for the session is going to be tensorial tomographic differential phase contrast microscopy. Um, and the work's gonna be presented by uh, Shiki Shu. Did I say that right? Um, okay, all right, so take it away, thanks. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shi Qi. So I'm a student in computational optics lab from Duke University. So I'll be presenting our work on tensorial tomographic differential phase contrast microscopy. Uh, we call it T squared DPC. So I'll start with introducing a, a quite sp I mean, typical microscopy example. So if we look at a, I mean, look more carefully at a smaller region, you can see. Uh, so this is a intensity image. So you can see the like some brighter region, some like darker region, and it's colorful. And the reason it's colorful is because it's stained. So this is uh, due to the absorption of the light. And uh, so typically, if you ask a pathologist to look at an image, that's what they, uh, they typically are looking for. But we know that uh, uh, light is also a wave, so it can also have a face. So and I think we've been studying, I mean, we've been hearing a lot about the uh, uh, importance of the face yesterday. Uh, and if you go a little bit beyond, you say, oh, light is more than a wave, it's actually electric, electric field. So you actually also have the polarization dependent properties such as detonation and biofringence. So uh, this talk will be focusing more on the like, phase and the polarization property of the sample. Uh, so uh, you may ask, why do we even care about polarization? All right, so uh, I mean, it's useful in a lot of ways, but for, uh, like the field I come with, which is biomedical imaging, uh, we we think polarization is very useful for medicine. So, I um, mean, and biology studies. So, for instance, you can just so in, in this work, people actually just look at a polarization modulation from the lipid membrane. So, from that, you can actually tell if the cell is in uh, early endosome or late endosome, right? And uh, here, I also show images. So, the the first one is actually a bright field image. 
unstained uh, from a liver tissue. This one. And uh, you can't really see any contrast, but actually with the polarization property, you can identify the cancer from the liver tissue. Right. And the last one, it's this one I think is maybe more common. You can actually detect malaria. So malaria actually has some biofringent property, uh, even from the unstained cell. If you look at the polarization property, you can tell, oh, there's a like, malaria infection. Right, so, uh, so like I said, the, the work we were, we were more interested in, like retrieving both phase and polarization property of the sample. So uh, for a while, it has been done by uh, interferometry. So I mean, in order to like retrieve the like phase and polarization property, one popular method is just to uh, try to recover the Jones matrix. And uh, one of the early work is done by uh, Garby Papasco's lab. So uh, so Garby is a very kind person, and uh, I guess a lot of you know. Unfortunately, recently he uh, tragically died uh, in a psycho accident. And uh, if you want to get rid of the uh, Reference sum, you can also do common shot, like a common pass method. But uh, in both cases, so both cases, they, they can be done in a single shot, but uh, typically you use a laser. I mean, you need to use a laser, so which means you have to deal with the alignment issue and also potentially the speckle noise. Um, so recently, there are actually more works on uh, use computation to retrieve the uh, polarization phase or the Jones matrix. Uh, so usually, those methods are multi shots. And, Basically, you just trade off your temporal resolution, uh, but now you can do phase retrieval. So for instance, people do something called a Vectoria for a Vectoria tachograph, where you can actually just shine a very focused beam and you translate the beam. And uh, if you actually measure the full, uh, like the polarized the light field, I mean, for polarized the intensity, you can actually retrieve the hologram of the, so in this case, it's a matter surface. Right, and uh, also there's a network from Biohub. Uh, so the idea here is they actually use something we learned yesterday, which is called a uh, uh, phase from defocus. So they take a focal stack, uh, but they put like two LCD, they rotate the LCD, and they can get a polarization property. So in this case, it's a, I think it's a brain section of a, uh, of a hippocampus. So they like uh, HSV plot the uh, orientation on the brain, and they use those to identify different brain regions. Right. So, I mean, of course, we also joined a party, uh, and we, I think this is work done by uh, my former colleague, uh, Sean, sitting here, uh, sitting there in the audience. So, uh, what we do is we extend the fur tachograph to the Vectoria case, where we just, like, use polarized light. Uh, and uh, it's an extension for a tachograph, so you can actually get a benefit of a tachograph, which is like high resolution, wide field of view. But uh, now we can actually get uh, not only the phase and amplitude, but the phase and amplitude of the entire Jones matrix. So from which you can actually retrieve, uh, so of course the scalar property, which is the amplitude and phase, but also the vectorial or the polarization properties, such as the retardance, the attenuation, and the orientation. Right, and uh, as we learned yesterday, because the for a tachograph, this kind of data redundancy, uh, you can actually uh, able you are actually able to recover the embedded aberration as well. And in the Victoria case, we can actually recover the Jones matrix of the pupil. Uh, so in this case, it's actually glass like a standard objective, so you don't see too many like anisotropy. But uh, uh, we, we are hopeful that. Uh, so for such as things like metal lens or maybe plastic lens, uh, it can be like a, it can make a difference. Right. So we've, I've been talking about like a, how do you get a 2D or like maybe like a, a one layer, but yeah. So I've been talking about how to, how to get a 2D Jones matrix, but like uh, in 3D, how do you get a like a, so for sacred sample which have layered structure, how do you like uh, get a depth resolved measurement. Uh, and let's say you don't want to do the interferometry either because you don't like the alignment or you don't want the potential speckle noise. So uh, in scalar case, I think there are uh, a few ways to do that. The first category uh, goes by the name of Fourier tachographic tomography or uh, intensity diffraction tomography as well, I think. Uh, so the idea is you just do diffraction tomography with, but with a partially coherent LED and you shine from different angles. And uh, you, so in that case, you actually sample the sample in the 
uh, frequency domain, the case space, and you like shine light from different angle, you get an E-word sphere uh, in a case space, and you can recover. And because you like uh, this data data redundancy, you shine light from different angle, you, you can do phase retrieval. So not necessarily you need a reference beam. And uh, another work, which is like a, this talk is based on is some, this technique called 3D differential phase contrast microscopy. Uh, so the idea is you actually take a focal stack, but uh, at each focal, at each depth, you actually use typically four different patterns, and usually they are like circular patterns. And from there, you can compute the transfer. From, so under the weak phase, I think called a weak, weak object assumption, you can actually compute a, a transfer function in the case space and uh, try to recover the object. So I'll be touching this a bit more later, because that's how I mean, what our work based on. Um, but just like uh, actually more recently, people uh, tried to recover the uh, depth resolved uh, polarization imaging. So in this case, a group from EPFL, they uh, use diffraction tomography. So it's a standard diffraction tomography setup. Uh, so here's a Garvo mirror, so you can steer the beam, take the, like you can like uh, shine the sample from different angle, and uh, except they use a uh, polarization generator and analyzer, so now the measurements are actually polarized uh, different at different angle, and uh, so from which you can uh, actually reconstruct in the, you can actually reconstruct the uh, transverse permittivity matrix. So ignoring uh, or let's say just the z polarization is not that not that strong. Uh, so, I mean, in this case, they actually use a tomographic setup, but uh, uh, in my opinion, I think you can also get rid of the reference beam, just you do phase retrieval, right? Well, our work actually based on the technique called the 3D differential phase contrast microscopy. Uh, and let me just reiterate, uh, uh, so the measurement, we, when you do a measurement, you actually take a Z focal stack, and uh, for each steps, you typically do four, like, uh, urination patterns. Right, and uh, usually they are like, uh, so typically they are just half circles. And from, so, so by in, in doing this way, you're actually uh, measuring the sample in K space. Uh, I mean, so the absorption and the, oops, sorry. So the absorption and the, the phase component of your permittivity matrix actually, uh, the, you can compute a transfer function for those. And the, I mean, so once you have the transfer function, you can actually do it like deconvolution, like uh, reconstruction, and you get objects, uh, case space representation, and then you just inverse Fourier transform it to get a 3D refractive index. All right, so, uh, so we build, so our setup built on the DPC, idea of DPC, except we uh, extend it to the tensorial case. So the setup actually is made with a uh, LED matrix as illumination. Uh, and we use like uh, four popular patterns what they used in the DPC field, and uh, uh, right after, I mean, actually before the right before the sample, we put a uh, polarizer, a like gener polarization generator. Uh, in this case, it's a left circular polarizer made with a, a linear polarizer and a quarter wave plate. All right then, we have our anisotropic sample, uh, and uh, after that, it's a, a standard microscopy uh, setup which is made with which is composed of a, an, an infinite space objective and a tube lens. And rather than put an analyzer, uh, which is usually placed in the infinite space, we, uh, in this case, we actually use a polarized camera. So uh, the polarization analyzer is actually placed right in front of the uh, pixel. All right, so, um, all right, so for different illumination, you can actually uh, and different polarization configurations, you can actually gen generate those like donor shape transfer functions. And from there, you can uh, try to reconstruct the uh, uh, like a depth resolved, uh, a rep depth resolved permittivity matrix. But again, we also make the, uh, the transverse approximation, so we assume the Z polarization is not that significant. All right, so to validate our, I mean, to validate our master, we uh, take images for a bunch of a few of uh, like uh, calibration samples. So the first sample we use is a uh, monosodium urate MSU sample. So the reason we use it is because the it, those are like needle shaped samples. So the orientation of the structural orientation is actually aligned with the. Uh, I'll go quickly. 
is actually aligned with the optical orientation. So it's a two-layer uh, sample. So we did a like tomographic reconstruction, and if we zoom into some like those needles, we can see the um, they actually like meet our expectations. So the second validation sample we uh, use is uh, polystyrene microspheres. Uh, so so interesting because it's low contrast. Uh, actually, when you in focus, the bees will disappear. So that's one more reason we need a phase. Right, and we look at the cross section, the resolution is actually not very good because we take with a low NA objective. Uh, but if we do the reconstruction, uh, we can actually reconstruct the, not only the uh, permittivity, like the isotropic refractor index, but also the biofringence. So you see in the biofringence, there are actually line look like artifacts, but we would suspect that's just because of the edge biofringence of the uh, cover glass. Right, so lastly, we actually reconstruct a sample uh, called amyloid So it's a hard tissue biopsy with amyloidosis. So the way you do that, you just like you take a needle, like a biopsy, you freeze it and you sting it. I mean, you section and you sting it. And uh, it's a very lethal disease and underdiagnosed. The reason is because uh, you need a very uh, experienced pathology. Usually they just put it under a polarized microscope and you just rotate the analyzer in the generator to a certain angle. And if you don't see this like a uh, so-called apple green color, then uh, maybe you're fine, but if you see this uh, apple green color, then good luck, because it's, uh, it's like only 5% will survive in 10 years. Uh, but the, this color actually comes from the uh, biofringin. So if we do our reconstruction, we actually show that the, biofring, the biofringin's reconstruction is correlated with the qualitative, like a pathological uh, current gold standard. Right, and because we do the like tomographic reconstruction, we can also just focus. I mean, digitally look at uh, different slices. All right. So in summary, we propose a uh, method to computationally recover tomographic transverse uh, permittivity tensor of any isotropic samples. And we validate the method with a bunch of calibration targets and show it can be predictive pathology. And uh, future work, I think one direction is to explore a like diffraction tomography type of illumination, so we can build a setup uh, to measure the data without mo any moving components. All right, so uh, great thanks for my collaborators, I mean my lab, and thank you for your attention and greatest appreciation to our funding resources. And if you have questions, uh, sorry I go a bit too long maybe, but feel free to reach out uh, offline, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I think we should uh, we should move on to the next talk. All right, sorry. Um, so no, it, it's okay. You're still under 15. So, uh, but uh, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and take them offline. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we're moving on to the final paper from this session. Um, this is going to be called Style Transfer with Biorealistic Appearance Manipulation for Skin Tone Inclusive RPPG. Um, the presenters, are you guys co-presenting? Yeah, yeah. yeah, the presenters will be uh, Yunha Bao and Zhen Wang uh, from UCLA. Um, so yeah, when you guys are ready, go ahead and take it away. Oops, 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 oops. <clears throat> okay, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Jun Wang. Uh, I'm here to present our work together with my colleagues Yin Hao Ba, Dark Harenka, Dennis Bosker, and Professor Achuda Kalendi. We are from UCRA in the Visual Machines Group. So if you look at this title, I know it's a bit long and a bit mouthful. So let me just cross it out for now and tell you the tremendously important topic I'm going to introduce today, which is fairness in light transport. Okay, so how many of you in the audience have seen this image before? Okay, I saw a lot of them. But actually, this is not an image. This is a video, as you can see from this magnification. So what is happening here? So your heart is like a pump. Every time it pumps blood onto your face, there's gonna be periodic, subtle, and invisible color change on your face. And on the right, here's a very beautiful magnification, visualization, uh, using the technique from uh, the, our very own program chair, Professor Bill Freeman's group in SIGGRAPH 2012. Okay, the first time we read this paper in our reading group at UCRA, we were wondering, how would this work for darker skin tones? So we did some digging. Uh, we did some Googling and we dig deeper into this. So actually the color change on the face is a, is a medical technology called remote photoplasmography, or RPBG. 
So you have an input of video sequence captured by your camera. And uh, you can get the uh, extracted physiological signals, the blood volume change, uh, using either signal processing or deep learning nowadays. So the advantage of this method is that it's contactless, it's not contact and it's very low cost. So basically what you need is just a commodity camera and I can give you your heart rate. Okay, so RPBG is a very important technique because it can detect vital signs from invisible color change on the face. But it also comes with challenges. So here are two videos from UCRA, vital data set. So on the left, we have a subject of light skin tones. And on the right, we have a subject of darker skin tones. As you can see from the extracted RPBG wave and the detected heart rate from highlighting the gray box, you can see that the RPG wave of light skin tones is a bit more regular than the one showing on the right. And also the heart rate accuracy is like better for light skin tone. So prior work has, has also identified this this bias among different skin tones, for example, in Eva Novara's work. Okay, so there are, a couple really, there are a couple ways to solve this bias problem. For example, using other cues. If you look at my face, there's very subtle micro motion caused by the heartbeat. It's called BCG. But the performance is not clinically accurate. And also, there are image signal process solutions. As an example showing here from my colleague, Pradyumna Chari, diverse RPBG, it's still not clinically accurate. It has like larger than three bits per minute mean absolute error. And also nowadays there are machine learning methods. Two representative work here showing is a face net and deep face. It's good, it's accurate. It has smaller than three bits per minute mean absolute error, but it, it has four times larger error on dark skin tones than on light skin tones. So why machine learning methods are biased? So possible reasons include first, the physics of light. And second, data set imbalance. And we're gonna tackle the bias problem from the second perspective, which is the data set imbalance. Okay, so a direct solution is that, a direct solution is that, can we just increase the amount of dark skin su real subjects in the training phase? So given, it, it turns out that even given enough time and money, it's very difficult to collect real dark skin subjects, especially in the context of COVID-19. And in some countries, as showing this skin tone world map, it's just simply not possible to collect a diverse real subject data set. Okay, so if it's very hard to collect a large scale real data set, can we just generate some synthetic samples? using uh, existing site transfer methods. For example, we have input facial data set of which we have many. Can we, can we just use some cycle gain method to style transfer the light skin tone subject to dark skin tone subject? And we can just do that for each frame of a video. But there's a problem. So you can see that the naively style transfer the video, if you look at the extracted RPG wave, is and, and if you also look at the detected heart rate, it's like 30 bits per minute off. So the, so the information about RPBG is not preserved using just naively slide transfer method. Okay, how about we just add a new loss term? So we have, set, we have two goals. The first goal is to achieve skin color translation. We can just use a appearance loss to achieve the first goal. And we can just add a loss term RPBG loss uh, which uses uh, an RPBG estimator as a regularizer. But there's another problem. So, if you, so here are two examples from the UCR vital data set. You can see that the, the, the estimated heart rate and the RPG wave is far worse than the, light, than the light skin tones on the left. So the problem is that the, regular, the regularizer itself is biased. So in the following, my colleague Inhao Ba is gonna introduce our solution to this bias problem. Oh, thanks, Jun. And uh, for our master, we still keep the generation phase where uh, it's basically similar to what Jen introduced earlier. And then we introduce another stage called RPPG estimation stage, where in this stage, instead we freeze the generator and update the weights of estimator based on the synthetic samples. And these two stages are alternated uh, during training and uh, will stop training when both models converge. Okay, so let's get a bit deeper into each stage. 
For the generation stage, we have uh, two loss terms, uh, appearance loss to control the appearance and RPPG loss to encourage the RPPG signal. For the appearance loss, we use a threshold R1 loss. The intuition behind that is uh, if the generated frame is close enough to the to the, to the ground truth, we don't back propagate the loss, don't add too much penalty, so that we have some extra space to incorporate the RPPG signal. And uh, for the RPPG loss, uh, we use the traditional negative piercing correlation loss to measure the distance between the, the, the ground truth and the detected RPPG signal. And uh, it should be noted that the generator is first pre-trained to reproduce the pseudo ground truth just to make the training like, more stabilized. And next, for the estimation stage, uh, we freeze the generator and update the weights of the estimator. And uh, similarly, uh, in this stage, we feed both the real samples and the synthetic samples to the estimator. And we want to hope the estimator can preserve its performance on real samples, but uh, it'll generalize, like, gradually to adapt to the synthetic samples. And uh, similarly, this uh, estimator is also pre-trained to perform estimation on real samples, just to make the training like converge a bit easier. Okay, let's see some results. And Jen has shared this naive translation results, and uh, you can see the naive translation did not preserve the heart rate and the frequency is a bit off. And for the proposed method, you can see that the frequency is correct, and uh, also the heart rate is uh, pretty accurate. So it seems like it's working. And uh, next, uh, there are some more visualizations. Uh, we show some samples in the UBFC RPPG datasets with uh, different ages, genders. And uh, you can see that uh, for all these samples, the uh, like detected uh, RPPG form for the synthetic and real subjects are uh, quite overlapped. And, uh, and uh, also, if we project them into the frequency domain, the heart rate uh, matches with uh, each other. Okay, next, uh, let's see some numbers. Uh, uh, we performed the evaluation with four different matrices on the UBSC dataset, and for the heart rate, we use MAE, RMSE, and the Pearson correlation. And uh, for the actual detected wave, we use the uh, SNR metric. And uh, as compared with the proposed method, we also include comparison on one of the existing state-of-the-art methods called 3D CNN, and uh, for that method, we trained uh, from scratch with the generated synthetic samples directly from the generator. And some physics-based solutions as well. And uh, you can see that uh, when we incorporate some synthetic samples, we see a clear improvement on the EBSD datasets. Okay, and uh, it should be noted that uh, like uh, these diverse samples also help with the uh, subjects with lighter skin tones. Even though this data set dominated by white, you can see uh, like a uh, light skin subjects, you can still see some improvement. And uh, we have an ECCV paper following up about to analyze this phenomenon. Okay, and then later we do a cross data set evaluation where for this evaluation, we still use the model trained on the UBS data set and we use the model from them and uh, test on the like, white data set directly. And uh, thanks again to my colleague Pradubna, who's also here. And uh, so to try hard to collect the data set and uh, we do have some skin color labels in the data set. So you can see the performance for each skin color group. And uh, also, uh, like uh, as uh, in the UBS data set, you see some improvement with the <coughs> With the, with the like proposed augmentation technique. Okay, finally, let's back to the uh, the very first uh, example. Like this is a uh, real subject in the UBFC uh, in the wider data sets, and uh, that's the uh, its performance if we trained with uh, just the real samples and from the UBFC data sets, and uh, it's uh, not good as we want. And uh, after we incorporate some synthetic samples, we can see that the performance is uh, a lot better and the uh, heart rate is very accurate. So, uh, and uh, I think that's the, yeah. Next, I think uh, Jim will talk some future work. Next. Okay, so for future, there are other dimension of biases we can look at. There are physical bias, and there are also uh, interpretation bias. You can check out more details in this uh, our group's paper, Academic Science 2021. Okay, so the future we envision is a concept called digital patients, physiologically accurate neural renders that can simulate not just blood flow in the face, but also breathing signal. So if you look at my face, there's very micro motion caused by the heartbeat. 
and also arterial fibrillation, blood pressure, and blood oxygenation. And to have a diverse digital patients, we need methods that can not, that can not just translate, be, translate be between light to dark. And also, uh, we need more biorealistic magnitude, magnitude manipulation during translation. And also, we need a better, better metrics to quantify bias. So again, uh, this is joint work with uh, this amazing team. And I want to conclude my talk with some ethics statement. So uh, we, are, we are basically developing re new rendering techniques to create synthetic data for healthcare algorithms to make medical devices Showing, uh, showing this example, RPBG more inclusive, and we condemn the use, the misuse of these techniques. And also, this paper basically proposed a th synthetic augmentation method to reduce bias. There are also some other ways. For example, introducing novel sensor modality, for example, radar. Make sure to check CQRP presentation from our group next week in Vancouver. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, uh, thank you. I think I lost my mic here. All right, uh, we have uh, time for a few questions. Um, all right, all right Nirja. Hi, thank you for your talk. Can you go back to your results with the uh, real patient, comparing the old method and your new method? Um, I was just a little confused because I had trouble interpreting um, the ground truth difference between the two plots. Can you kind of like quantify how much better your, your method was? Uh, I, sorry, I think uh, you mean the performance. They are quantified by the matrices we showed earlier. Sorry, uh, can you can, can you speak up? Sorry, uh, for the performance, they are quantified by the matrices we showed earlier. For heart rate, we use MAE, RMSE, and Pearson correlation, and for the wave, we use the noise signal to noise ratio. It's in the previous table. Uh, yes, yeah, this table and and uh, this table. Is that? Okay, so question. this data set was with real patients with Yeah, yeah, all the data set we tested are real patients. Okay. So these numbers are all for real subjects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, all right, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I'll ask one. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, you mentioned the idea that light-based methods might be inherently biased. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, have you considered uh, like any kind of active elimination or sort of other ways that you could probe the skin to sort of like remove the bias uh, in the optical domain. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, we don't do that because uh, uh, the one of the advantage of RPBG is quite cheap and we don't require active illumination. But I think it's a great uh, like direction. For example, if the signal to noise ratio for darker skin subjects is very low, maybe we can have extra light for them. Maybe we can have a similar strength of the signal. But it's a pretty good direction. Just uh, we don't uh, kind of do that. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay, um, so let's thank the speakers one more time. Um, and that brings us to the end of the session. Um, so, okay, so I think up next we have uh, our next invited speaker. And Mark will be introducing us. I'll just give you some. Uh, hi everyone, this is our last talk uh, before the coffee break. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Rajesh Menon. Uh, Rajesh is the director of the Laboratory for Optical Nanotechnologies at the University of Utah, where he does research in various fields, including inverse design photonics, flat lenses, nano manufacturing, and unconventional imaging. Uh, Rajesh has also had a really busy career. He has over 150 publications, wrote over 40 patents, and has four spin-off companies. He also won several uh, notable awards, including the NASA Early Stage Innovation Award, the NSF Career Award, and the International Commission for Optics Prize. And now, uh, he'll give us a talk with uh, a very uh, interesting title, called Non-Anthropocentric Imaging with and Without Optics.
So. Th thank you very much. And, and let me begin by uh, thanking all of you for, uh, for the organizers for inviting me, particularly Lei Chen and uh, Katie Bowman and Ernest. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me start by uh, uh, drawing upon uh, uh, Professor Chang Hui Yang's talk yesterday, where he really emphasized this idea of um, we have been thinking about imaging systems from a very human-centric or anthropocentric perspective for the last century or so. And uh, we are starting to get to this realization that uh, perhaps it's a little bit um, uh, constrained. So, you know, perhaps opening up our uh, design perspective for imaging systems beyond a uh, human-centric perspective can lead to some interesting and uh, certainly uh, 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 potentially very useful uh, uh, systems and applications. And, I, and what I hope to do today in uh, very briefly is to kind of talk about a few examples along these lines. Some of them may not perfectly line up. Um, I'm gonna uh, begin by, this is work, nope. Uh, acknowledging a variety of former and current students, one of whom is actually in the audience today. Pang was uh, here earlier. Uh, he started some of the work um, in the lab, Gang uh, Hoon, and um, particularly, I should also point out Ali, uh, who started some of the original work in uh, optics free imaging, which I'll talk about later on, uh, actually, as an undergraduate student. So uh, I'll come back to some of these. So, in a, in a sense, if you look at any camera today, we essentially do this. Uh, we co-optimize the hardware, um, optics, the sensors, and whatever happens afterwards, which nowadays is all kinds of machine learning. I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm just going to put that up there. Um, but what are we trying to do with all of these uh, things? Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, in for the last, uh, a lot of times we are creating beauty or beautiful images or video. But these are all primarily aimed at humans. But if we take a step back and think about what are the vast majority of images uh, created today, uh, I would even make the claim that within the last decade, 99% of the images taken today are never seen by humans. Uh, even pictures you take, I mean, I don't. I mean, I take pictures of my kit, but I don't think I look at every single picture. So, I mean, these are obvious examples. So, really begs the question, um, uh, again, <laughs> drawing upon what uh, Cheng Hui Yang was mentioning yesterday, you know, if we step back and look at this, can we think, rethink this entire paradigm from a non-anthropocentric perspective or non-human perspective? And we can think about this as machine perception. In other words, how, do you, how does a machine perceive its environment, its surroundings, and so on? Uh, and I want to talk about several examples. The first example is a little bit of a deviation from this particular topic, but bear with me as I will hopefully tie it back here. First example comes from a uh, field uh, which uh, uh, I entered only in the last decade or so, so I'm fairly new to it. And uh, of course, we got a nice introduction from uh, Professor Lee Hong uh, Wang earlier today, is in deep brain microscopy. So the problem, uh, I was approached by some neuroscientists to build a miniaturized microscope in order to look deep inside the mouse brain. And the idea is that uh, we want to be able to see a few millimeters in in, and, and of course, eventually do three-dimensional imaging with as large field of view and high resolution as possible, which of course is a difficult problem. Now, why is this difficult? Uh, first of all, we have the skull. So the skull is, uh, so I should step back and say, first of all, we're looking at fluorescence images, particularly because of specificity. So a lot of times you can label certain cells and you want to follow them and so on. So for that specificity perspective, we want fluorescence. So for fluorescence, you need an optical excitation or visible light, typically excitation, and you want to collect visible light coming out. Of course, skull is opaque, so we can't do that. So first challenge is we have to remove the skull a little bit. Uh, it's called craniotomy, and we uh, have to close it with a, with a cover slip to prevent infection and so on. And then we typically put a water immersion in objective, which is relatively big, and we want to look deep in. And, and these are in the case of single photon microscopy, as we have seen before, because of scattering in the tissue, you can only go you know, maybe 
in a few hundred microns. With two photon microscopy, you, uh, sorry, tens of microns. With two photon microscopy, you may go a little bit deeper, up to about 200 microns or so. However, if you want to go a little bit more deep, uh, there are approaches like photoacoustic microscopy, which we heard about today, uh, but we cannot use fluorescence. So one of the approaches that has been uh, very successful in looking deeper inside the brain is what's referred to as microendoscopy. And I'll particularly talk about single photon microendoscopy, although there are other approaches to do multi-photon as well. I won't really delve on that, but the principles are, uh, uh, are the, 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 the con concepts I'm going to talk about are similar. So I'm going to show you just two examples of what the state of the art of uh, microendoscopy is. So what is microendoscopy? You make a small incision uh, after the skull is removed, and a very thin endoscope is inserted into the brain. And typically, there's a green lens that transports the light in and out. And it forms images which looks like that. This is GCAM, it's essentially a protein that fluoresces, which labels, follows calcium around. So wherever there's calcium, you get light, and by following it, you can follow calcium. Now calcium is important because of all the action potential in the neuron fires. Cal calcium is, uh, is, is, the, is the medium with which the action potentials are, uh, are, are carried. So, Obviously, you can see one problem. This, uh, even, even when they're inserted, you, you get a very low contrast image. So this is a challenge. And an important problem that we are going to address today is this fact that the vast majority of these microendoscopes tend to be quite big. They're about half a millimeter or larger in diameter because we have a green lens there. As many of you know, in order to get a sufficiently large field of view, you need to have a lens whose um, uh, diameters you know, several times larger than the desired field of view. And I'll come back to that point later. The second, and, and because of this, uh, because of this relatively large probe, uh, this is another example where the, the, after the imaging was done, you do a histopathology, you can see a huge portion of the brain actually has been removed. And that's a pretty significant uh, perturbation to the brain. And we, it's not quite clear uh, how that perturbation affects your measurements. So there's this question, right? So if you're, if you're disturbing the brain so much and then doing the imaging, is that the same as not disturbing the brain as much? Of course, we are not doing uh, non-invasive imaging here, but we're simply trying to minimize the brain tissue trauma. How do we do this? We simply reduce the size of the probe. So this is a conventional, uh, roughly half a millimeter diameter green lens-based probe. We want to replace it with simple something called a cannula, which is a solid glass needle simply behaving like a multi-mode, short segment multi-mode fiber. Some of you are probably very familiar with this. That corresponds to about an 80% reduction volume. Fortunately, this is a very common uh, device used in optogenetics today, which is, uh, uh, you can, uh, they're relatively cheap, easy to insert. There are very standard protocols to do this and so on. How does this work? There, there's no imaging element here, so computation is necessary. So let me walk you through some very simple ideas here. They're relatively simple. So if you look, that, that is what the surgical cannula looks like. I'm going to stand over here. Um, this is a, this uh, segment is what's inserted into the brain. In this example, is two millimeters, but we can use many different uh, uh, lengths. All the devices I'm going to talk about, at least in this section of the talk, is about 220 microns in diameter. So if you imagine there's a point source on one side of this glass needle, uh, uh, some of this light is collected into the glass needle. Remember, this is a short segment multi-mode fiber. Um, and what you get on this side is, of course, does not preserve the spatial localization of the point on this side, right? So you end up with a very complex pattern on this side. And this is an actual experimental data. This is not simulated. Now, what's really nice is that this if this point source moves to a slightly different spot, here it moved from x1 to x2, this pattern changes. So we have space variance in the points per function, which is typically a bad thing for photography, but here we are going to take advantage of it because we're looking at incoherent objects like fluorescence. So imagine an incoherent object like this, it's comprised of point sources, which are each producing a response, its points per function, and adding them all up in intensity. No face here. This is uh, purely incoherent. Now, this is, of course, a linear uh, system of equations. You can solve it. Ill-conditioned, but you can solve it, nevertheless, if you knew what the transfer function was. And that's what we did in brute force many years ago, where by 
measuring the transfer function, in other words, the points per function is a function of x and y in this case. Uh, remember the radial symmetry is broken, but anyway. Uh, we, can re we can take this sort of an image and reconstruct an image like that, which represents the actual object we were using and get very close to the, the resolutions that we want. And we can do all kinds of interesting things, even some amount of refocusing and so on by appropriate calibration. But, so using this idea, we can, um, uh, uh, then build a microscope. So this is uh, the schematic of the microscope. We typically have a brain sample into which the scannula is inserted, and on top of it we have a standard microscope. So this portion is outside the brain, this is inside the brain. We use the same cannula, it's an epi, epi configuration, which means that the, the laser excitation goes through the same cannula, the fluorescence is collected back from the same cannula, they're different wavelengths, so you can separate them out up, upstream. And the rest of the microscope is very stra straightforward. These are some photographs of where you can see uh, the, the cannula is outside the brain, here's inside the brain. This is the whole brain removed from the mouse, so obviously not the mouse. And these are just some reconstructed images in the interest of time. I won't go into the details, but these are what are called uh, glial cells, not, not real neurons. They're uh, TD tomato labels, so that's a red protein, um, uh, red uh, reporter. But what I would point out though, is that we were able to go as deep as about 1.8 millimeters, which at that time uh, was one of the deepest uh, demonstrations where we were able to actually uh, make out cell bodies and so on. Of course, um, validation is a tricky thing because you have to do histo histopathology, which I, we did not get a chance to do in this particular case. I'll show you some examples later. Uh, of course, our goal was to do uh, uh, an awake mouse. Uh, this, this was a preliminary experiment where we did not actually do the surgery. We simply had a craniotomy and we were looking at the surface. And the reason is because we wanted to do validation. And here's the example of the validation where we have a reconstructed image of uh, peripheral immune cells labeled with uh, 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 EGFP. And uh, here's a bright field image where you can actually see them. So we have some way to validate it, and we also did a two photon image which gets a higher contrast. Um, the approach is very fast because it's a single shot reconstruction, right? We're taking a single picture, so uh, it can be in the order of milliseconds nowadays, so we can do uh, real time. So this is simply a video of the mouse breathing, and, and, and you can see this is changing slightly and the reconstructed image changes. Now, of course, more recently, we can, uh, so previously all of that work was done by simply uh, linear algebra, so you have all kinds of uh, regularization techniques. Uh, Tick and now is what we really started with. And nowadays we use uh, simple autoencoders. More recently, we showed that because we can actually build a microscope to gather ground truth, and so we have paired images, so we can train all kinds of networks to reconstruct this. So this is, for example, I'll just take another, uh, this is an example of one of the input the, the acquired images, and this is, uh, we had a ground truth image here, and there's the reconstructed image here. And you can get a pretty uh, reasonable reconstruction, as you can see, uh, uh, quantified by these SSIM and MAE numbers. Uh, we can get subcellular resolution, something like five to seven, five to 10 microns. In, in our earlier work with the beads, we showed that you could, in principle, get down to diffraction limited resolution. However, that requires fairly high SNR, as you can imagine. So there are some limitations there. What, what's interesting is that even though we're getting intensity images, we can do some level of uh, computational optical sectioning. Essentially, we can get the depth. And the way we did this was uh, quite straightforward. Uh, imagine we had a thick sample. Um, from one side we had the cannula looking, from the other side we had a reference microscope which I've drawn here, and we were able to focus on different uh, layers uh, uh, or planes uh, with the reference micro microscope. And by collecting images um, uh, from these different planes on the cannula, we can actually train uh, and, and uh, predict essentially the layer number using what we call a classifier network. So, it, it, uh, and the the idea is that we can input an image like this with some level of uh, 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 probability we can predict a particular output layer and then predict what depth that light came from. Of course, it's not perfect because again, we're only getting intensity information that's not face. But we can do it relatively well. For example, these are some examples with, uh, where we trained with cultured neurons. These are actually validation uh, testing images where we trained with cultured neurons, so that's an input image 
this is a ground through that's the reconstruction. Obviously, we are losing some information, but we predict the layer index here. Now, of course, our goal is to take this, take this and stick it into the whole brain, which is what we did. And uh, so we train with the cultured neurons, then we, we image inside the brain. We, in this example, we started at the one millimeter depth and went down in 40 micron steps, and we reconstructed the images. Of course, and we, we went quite deep. However, we have a problem. We don't have ground truth images. So this is uh, still not a fully solved problem. So, um, and actually, sorry, I'll come, I'll come back to that, but one thing to keep in mind is that here, I don't actually know how accurate I am here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting some images, but I don't know where they are because it's too deep to look at with most microscopy techniques. Otherwise, um, the only option I have is to go in and do histopathology, which is really difficult to do without guide stars and so on. So it's something we're working on, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, some of you <clears throat> are very familiar with this cycle GAN approach, which was proposed a few years ago, and we've seen this uh, uh, referred to in several talks uh, this this week. And um, we, are, we, are, we are using the cycle GAN. I won't go into much detail, but we're using the cycle GAN typically used for unpaired image sets. Here we have paired image sets. So in other words, we, have, we know what we are looking at. So what we are using the cycle GAN is to essentially enforce the, forward, the pro physics of the forward problem. And this turns out to be quite fruitful. Uh, I'll just show you some examples. So uh, you know, we have an input there. That's our ground truth uh, image. This is what the unit auto encoder predicts, and this is what, the, what we call the SC net predicts. And we can see you can preserve much higher spatial frequencies because you have this consistency that happens because you go in both, both directions. If anyone's interested, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it later. Now, I mentioned the problem of uh, not having ground truth from before. The way we have been addressing it more recently, although the best approaches, as I mentioned before, we want to try to get the ground truth data, we don't have it quite yet, it was to do ensembling. So the, the, the preliminary solution is to simply predict various images with very disparate networks. So we have a UNET, we have the cycle GAN, uh, self-consistent network, uh, we used to the standard SRR uh, super resolution network, and simply average them all. And hopefully, you know, if you all of them predict similar looking images, we have higher confidence. So we can, uh, there's some nice work from Professor Oshkin's group uh, where they did really nice probabilistic uh, confidence levels and so on. So we are not quite there yet, but that is the, the direction in which we're going in, in, in this case. And as I said before, we can also predict the depth and we can create three dimensional images. Uh, so same before. Now, um, one of the challenges is, uh, is the field of view. So all the images that I showed before, the field of view is limited by about uh, the, the diameter of the endoscope, which is about 200 microns, 220 microns. Um, our, very recently, we showed that we can actually parallelize this approach. So instead of using one cannula, we use two of them, or you can use four or whatnot. We just use two, so we had a, what we call an optrode. In this case, it's, a, it's not exactly the same as a cannula, slightly different, but nevertheless, we have a left left optrode and right optrode. And in this uh, case, we have a project with the Department of Energy where we're looking at cell wall formation, biofuel formation in plants. And here we're looking at the vesicles, which are these channels that are used to uh, drop water in, in, in plants like this. So we're looking at this as they're moving around, basically. So this is a way to increase the field of view. We can also parallelize this. Now I'm going to move on to my second example, which is in hyperspectral imaging. And um, uh, let me start with a little bit of um, uh, uh, pre prior work. And, and what I'm going to talk about here, uh, as you can see in, in this uh, schematic, I've been focusing on the optics of the sensor and the, and the post-processing. Previously, I talked a little bit about the optics, because instead of the optics, we had the cannula. Here I'm going to talk about the sensor. I'm going to modify the sensor somewhat to do uh, uh, spectral imaging. Pre prior to doing spectral imaging, we, we published some work on um, uh, what we call computational spectroscopy. The idea is very simple. Um, uh, so it's, this is a little blurred, but uh, we introduced a diffractive face plate in a, with a small uh, uh, standoff distance from a sensor, conventional monochrome sensor. And the idea is that the diffractive face plate is engineered to be highly dispersive. So we can you know, fabricate them. And the, when you have different wavelengths of lights over it, uh, uh, 
after it propagates through the diffractive phase plate on the sensor, it forms different intensity patterns because the phase gets converted to intensity. Note that there is no absorption. This is a purely phase uh, plate. And the idea is that when we have this mixture of all these intensity patterns, we can, again, apply an inverse problem, a computation, in order to extract the spectrum out. And we showed that this was uh, very, very, works very nicely. It's a very simple system, first of all, and it works very nicely. So, so here we show that you can extract the spectrum of a 532 nanometer laser you know, uh, with very, very high precision within you know, uh, less than a nanometer sort of uh, precision. And we, we, you can show that in these papers that less than sub one nanometer spectral precision can be achieved over the visible band. Now, of course, that's a spectrometer. So in other words, you just have one pixel. We wanted to do imaging. And to do imaging, we started off first with what we call a, uh, a lensless snapshot multispectral imaging. The, the, the hardware is still the same as before. We, we had a, a diffractive element, but now it's periodic, which is uh, periodic, so it's called a diffractive filter array, so it repeats. Now it repeats in the same or some multiple of the period of the CMOS sensor array, standard CMOS, monochrome sensor. And we uh, designed this, again, such that you have a, a dispersion that happens, and then we do an end-to-end -end optimization on the computation. So in other words, we can actually extract the spectrum out from this dispersed image that we capture. Uh, th this is uh, hardware, so we uh, fabricate this using optical grayscale lithography, uh, and you can see a, a unit cell here, which is about, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's about nine by nine microns or so. And then we, ins we install it on top of the uh, monochrome sensor, standard monochrome sensor, with a very small gap, in, typically in the order of tens of microns. Uh, that's a little bit tricky because you have to do alignment and so on, but anyway, it can be done. And the idea is that by cap and there's no lens, so we have an object really close by. So we capture the intensity image, and from the intensity image, because we know, again, we calibrate out, so we know the spatial spectral points per function, where the points per function is changing with both location, but in the position, as well as in spectrum, we can actually reconstruct the uh, spectral information, as well as the space information. So this is showing a slice through 480, 530, and so on. This is a five channel, uh, image, of course, to uh, this is the raw image we get out, which we call a diffractogram, it's simply a grayscale image, intensity image. And from this multispectral image, we can actually reconstruct the RGB, of course. And interestingly, we can compare it to a Bayer image. And what one notices if you, if you do this experiment very carefully with the same exposure time, same gain, and so on, is that the reconstructed RGB is, of course, much brighter than the reference Bayer image. And this is uh, obvious because this is color without absorption, right? The Bayer, of course, absorbs 70% of the light, so obviously you're only getting uh, so many photons. here. We are, not, we are absorbing 0% of the light, all the 100, oh, I shouldn't say zero because there's some reflected, Fresnel reflections, but anyway, we're using, we are getting a lot more photons, so we're actually getting color without absorption. As far as, when, uh, and more recently, this technology has been uh, commercialized by a company called uh, Lumos Imaging, where they've done much fancier things by adding a face, uh, sorry, adding a lens to increase the field of view. This is just a nice example where here you can see the monochrome diffractogram and here you see the, in this case, a 25 channel uh, uh, image, and there is the reconstructed RGB display. Now, why do this? Uh, uh, there are many reasons. First of all, it's a very simple system, right? You only need this diffractive element on top of a sensor and everything else is the same. The optics and all, all that is the same. Uh, uh, so it's a very inexpensive, potentially inexpensive system. But what is really exciting to me is the fact that you're dramatically reducing the amount of data. So typically, when you take a hyperspectral image, for instance, from space, you have a three-dimensional data cube like this. You have x, y, and lambda. However, we can take uh, uh, this natural information set and represent into a two-dimensional diffractogram. So you can compress one dimension completely out of the picture, which, of course, there are limitations, so it's a, it's a lossy compression in a sense, but you are dramatically reducing the data. And this is very important if you're in space because communication is expensive. Now, and, and I'll show you two, two more examples which, are, which I find very exciting, is that 
typically when, when uh, for instance, NASA looks at images like this, they, they, they might try to infer, okay, different uh, forest types or agricultural land and so on. Uh, and this is done with the spectral information, spatial spectral information, so you need the 3D data sets. However, we showed there recently that you can actually get the same sort of inferencing directly from the 2D diffractograms. So that's a very, very exciting area because now you're dramatically reducing the amount of data. Uh, uh, and, and this is along those lines, we did a very, very simple experiment. We bought um, uh, strawberries from the supermarket and imaged them with our camera over something like 10 days. So, and, and, and we had this training data set, we trained a neural network to essentially predict, take a raw image like this, that's our monochrome image, and predict an age map. In other words, for every pixel of this, of this image of the strawberry, predict how old it is. And that's what's shown here. So it's an inference, and this is predicted directly from the 2D data set, not going through a hyperspectral, the spectral information, spectral channel. So this is a very fresh strawberry, you can predict this is two and a half. 2.15 days and so on and so forth. And we had some statistical inferencing which shows that it's, this is very, very accurate. And, and generally speaking, to get this sort of a, a prediction, you have to go through the spectral, uh, 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 spatial spectral domain. So we can do this directly, so that's kind of nice. And as I was saying before, this is an example, this is a simulated example, previous uh, the strawberries were actual experiments, where we, we simulated, um, there are, this is publicly available Landsat 8 satellite data, and from there we can simulate what the diffractogram would look like and make a prediction of the land cover types, uh, probabilis probabilistic prediction of the land cover types and compare to the ground truth, and we showed that uh, the, the 2D data uh, sufficiently preserves the information to predict these land cover types very, very close to the ground truth. Of course, there's some loss in spatial resolution if you look very closely, but it's re really useful for uh, uh, a huge variety of applications. So we are using this for uh, some interesting things recently. Uh, I want to point out two more things. Uh, in this sort of a spectral imager, uh, we're, we're not really limited by hardware. So in, in one of the papers, we showed that uh, with the exact same hardware, uh, where we had uh, equally spaced spectral bands, by doing a different type of calibration, where we can use non-equal spectral bands. So for, for instance, this spectral band is about uh, 30 nanometers. This is um, uh, 50 nanometers, and so on and so forth. Non-equal spectral bands, you can still recreate a spectral, uh, in this case, a hyperspectral image. So here we're showing a picture from a U, but different bands. So you can see the, the, the uh, we are not limited in the uh, uh, spectral bandwidths that, are, that you're typically limited when the choice of hardware and the filters are made. So this uh, provides some interesting opportunities as well. The second point I also want to make, and the last point uh, for this example, is that you can also do what, what, what we call computational spectral filtering. So this is an example where we had six channels in, in spectrum, but we also had an 850 nanometer near-infrared laser, and we wanted to remove this laser from the image. So our image uh, looks like this. Uh, that's the ground truth, so we, that's a, this experiment, by the way. So this is our H, and we shine essentially a, a, this laser spot in, in the center of this H, and we can show computationally that we can extract the six bands, which are shown here, plus you can extract out the near IR laser, and you see that the near IR laser Although there's a little bit of crosstalk, almost completely is removed from the other bands. So there's a nice way to do computational spectral filtering. And this is just another example with the A where you can clearly see that the spot in an IR is, is, is removed and shows up in this band here. And with that, I will go to my last example, uh, is on truly non-anthropocentric cameras. And this is, to me, is almost like magic, and I'm very excited to share with you. And is, is what happens if you completely remove the optics? Now, this is a little bit different than lens-less imaging, where we have face masks, like I've shown you before. It's what, what we refer to as optics-free imaging. It's what, what I would think about as the simplest possible camera, where we remove all the optics. The only thing there is is a sensor. We have an object, and we are simply placing it at some standoff distance. Now, an image uh, uh, like this is formed, which is of course meaningless to you and me as humans, but with computation we show that you can either translate it for human consumption or we can do an inference. And, and hopefully I'll convince you in the next uh, last few slides. This is an example, an actual experiment 
uh, we took the sensor, no optics at all, placed it uh, at the world and took a video. And of course, to you or me, this is meaningless, but an appropriately trained algorithm actually can take this and produce a video like this. Uh, to me, this was, uh, I didn't think it would be possible. And of course, we need to know if it's correct, and that was our object. So this was the world that the sensor was seeing, and obviously it is correct. And what's even more exciting is that you can do optic-free image classification or inferencing directly, or machine perception with no optics. So we're all familiar with the fact that we can take an MNIST image like that and predict uh, and, and say that that's a digit three. But we are not so familiar with the fact that you can do the same with optics-free or optics-less camera, but take an image like that and then say it's the letter three. Instead of having to go through there and having a prediction, you can go straight from the optics-free image. So which means that there is sufficient information about the digit three in this sort of an image, even though there is no lens. And we showed uh, uh, fairly high validation accuracy with the standard uh, uh, classifier network. Um, with 10 classes of zero to nine, you can get a little over 90%, 92% or so. So now you can think about application-specific imaging or privacy-enhanced imaging where you know, a human may not understand what, what, what it is doing, but a machine may be able to um, uh, perform the function. And we very recently published a paper, we applied the uh, self-consistent network to this problem. And I'll just show you the, the results very quickly. Um, uh, this, is, this is the raw uh, acquired image. This is what the unit predicts. This is what we, sh we were using before. And here you can see the self-consistent network, which does a slightly better job to, to get closer to the ground truth. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's already pretty remarkable that you can even get these kinds of images. And we also showed that you can do a little bit of ensemble averaging and, and get things, you know, really think about this. You have an image like that, and you can really reproduce an image like that. This is not inferencing yet. This is simply uh, reconstruction. The, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, is some work that we did a few years ago on what we call a transparent camera. I'll, I'll end with this. It's a very simple experiment where we had a transparent plastic window. This is a plexiglass, essentially. And it is completely transparent. You can see through it. That was our object. And we had a sensor on the edge of it. OK, so let me uh, explain exactly what this is doing. So imagine you have a point source here. Most, the vast majority of the light passes straight through this transparent window. A, a small portion of the light gets trapped within the window because it's a slab waveguide. And if you roughen the surface on the, the surface facing the image sensor, a portion of the light gets collected by the image sensor. Now, of course, we also have to make sure that no direct light goes to the sensor in most cases. We don't have to do it all the time, but it improves the SNR. And we also put some um, reflective tape to ensure that the light is trapped within the window. And what we see is that uh, by appropriately training an algorithm, you can actually reconstruct reasonably good images. So this is the object. This is what the acquired image looks like, and this is our reconstruction. And uh, we can do this relatively fast, so I'll just uh, show uh, it's just a video that you can t go from an image like that to an image like that. You can do it in different colors. That was uh, green, this was red. And we can even change the object. So previously, we, we actually trained with uh, an LED matrix. We changed it to a, an iPad, um, uh, sorry, an iPhone display. And it still is able to do a reasonably good job. So take an image like that and predict that in different colors and so on and so forth. So with that, hopefully, I've, I've, I've given you a flavor for many, uh, uh, several examples where we can take standard things, what we are doing today, where we use lensed cameras and we perform some sort of inferencing. Uh, but we can also think about modifying the sensor. In this case, we introduced a diffractive filter array. It can be a meta surface, what, whatever, and, and extract uh, some additional information because in, this, in that case, you're, you're operating in the complex field or even completely removing the optics completely and, and producing inferencing. So in, in a sense, this anthropomorphic concept is going from the, the, the traditional idea of imaging to something which can be more naturally thought of as inferencing. And with that, I will, I'm happy to take questions, but I should also acknowledge various funding agencies as well as collaborators. Uh, a few more that I probably have forgotten to list here as well, as well as great students. Thank you very much.
So, uh, thank you for the fascinating talk, so many details. We're running a little bit behind schedule, so we'll have uh, time for just uh, maybe a few questions. My apologies. So, uh, <laughs> please step to the mic. Achuta. Great, uh, thanks so much, uh, Rajesh. Uh, so maybe I ask a little bit provocative question, sure, if it's sure. okay. Um, Those are the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the bare sensor uh, imaging, um, it's, it's really cool that you're getting the results, but kind of uh, why do it? Because you put a diffractive mask or you know, uh, any type of high frequency modulation optic in front, you overcome any light losses and uh, the complexity is minimal. So what would be kind of the application of bare sensor imaging uh, but it's, I think it's a really good, interesting yeah, yeah, problem yeah. as well. It's a, it's a valid question. Uh, I can tell you the, the reason we started looking at it was pure curiosity. I was just curious if it could, if it, if it would work. That was the only reason. And I was interested, and it was interesting that it works. Uh, in retro, retrospectively, you know, adding a mask is not so trivial because now we are trying to do it at a startup, so I can tell you this, this is uh, not a simple uh, process. So it does simplify a lot if you don't have to do anything to it. Now having said that, of course, uh, there are limitations, right? You, obviously they're not going to solve all the problems. So I think there is a room, and this is why I was saying the, 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 uh, the application specific imaging because I think everything that we'll be doing will be highly application specific. This is how electronics have gone. This is very likely how photonics and optics will go. And in, you know, in some cases we want the mass, some cases we want the lens, some cases we want both, some cases we don't want anything. So I think all of these are complementary in my opinion. But it's a great, great point. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, hello Rajesh, uh, amazing talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions, one uh, uh, on the lines of what Achuta asked. I was wondering, what's the distance between the object to the sensor in the bare sensor imaging, the example three that you gave? Because the only information we are getting is actually one by R squared, and I was wondering if the object has to be very close to the yeah. sensor or it can be far. Right, that's a great question. It depends on, on the resolution, you're of course, the space bandwidth product, right? So it's a, there's an angular resolution that you're capturing that determines the distance. So all the results I showed you are within one centimeter. So, uh, and we did do some, exp so the, the transparent camera was a little bit further. I think uh, it was a few inches away. I can't remember at the top of my head, but it was much farther away, you know, some, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. But the closer, the higher, so it's a space bandwidth. In other words, the, the higher resolution you want to extra, extract, you want to be closer, simply by the angular resolution you're... Makes uh, sense, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, one other quick question. For the transparent camera, uh, uh, I was just wondering, I mean, if I have a beam splitter, that's also a transparent camera, right? So why... Uh, say, say like, if I have a, like a beam splitter, yes. that's also like a transparent camera to yeah. me on one side, I can keep camera and... I was wondering what... Uh, uh, yeah, you could do that, yeah. I mean, we were just trying to see it could be much simpler. I mean, one of the ideas was to put a sensor on the side of glasses, for instance, for eye tracking. It could be very simple, you know. I see. It's hard to do with a beam splitter, your form factor is yeah. bigger. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> sure, thank you for the question. Okay, last question, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. So, uh, my question is about a transparent camera. So, uh, I think, uh, uh, you still need a camera that is not transparent, right? You, should, you still need a small camera that is... Uh, it, we uh, need a sensor, yeah. There are yeah. No, no lenses, it's just it's a chip, sensor chip on the side of the window. Yes, exactly. I see. Another question is about uh, optics-free uh, camera. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you stop a stray light? That's a good question. All the experiments that we've done is with no room light, so just the object. Now. Uh, the question of stray light, we have in the paper, we did do some experiments. The problem is you will end up with low SNR, but there are tricks that you can do with um, uh, background subtraction and frame averaging, which we haven't really explored, but I think there are ways to deal with it. Okay. The, yeah. one, one other thing I should have also pointed out, the vast majority of uh, ambient light is at 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. So if you had some way to temporarily also filter things out, which we have also tried some preliminary results as well along those lines, yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. Right. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll have a very short coffee break, and we'll try to start the keynote at the scheduled 11.30. So please be here, because we have a very tight schedule in the afternoon, and we don't want the schedule to shift. And also, uh, we'll be meeting here at the front with Professor Leon Wang to coordinate for the lab tour, uh, the tour of his lab in the afternoon. So please be back on time for the keynote.
Okay. Okay. Well, too late. <laughs> We're ready to go. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any announcements before? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's ready when you are. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm Bill Freeman, and I'm here to introduce today's keynote speaker, Joyce Farrell. She's a senior research associate and lecturer in the Stanford School of Engineering and the executive director of the Stanford Center for Imaging Systems Engineering. She comes to us from the human vision community. Uh, she received her doctorate from Stanford and was a postdoctoral fellow at NASA Ames Research Center at NYU and Xerox PARC before joining the research staff at Hewlett Packard. In 2000, Joyce joined Shutterfly, a startup company specializing in online digital photo finishing and in 2001 formed ImageVal Consulting, which specializes in tools for image systems simulation. So, welcome Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. And thank you, Katie, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I and mean, this is really just a fantastic meeting. I've learned a lot. Um, from all the great talks and all the great posters I've attended. And I really want to bring this back with me to Stanford, so when I contact you by email and I ask you to give a talk at Stanford, please say yes. Um, so um, I'm going to um, talk about work uh, that uh, Brian Wandell and I have done at Stanford over the last 20 years uh, to develop uh, software and methods for simulating the uh, and predicting the performance of different types of imaging sensors, or imaging systems rather I should say, sensors in the context of an imaging system. Uh, and of course we haven't done this work by ourselves. We've benefited from uh, all these wonderful graduate students and postdocs who passed through Stanford on their way to industry. And so here are some of the people who um, have helped us uh, develop these tools that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and today the goal of my talk is to give you a broad overview of how we think of the software for this end-to-end -end physics based image system simulation, uh, how we've organized it, uh, how we use it, and how we made it available for other people to use, which we really hope you will do. Uh, I'm going to start off with a summary of my talk. So again, I, I plan to describe the image system simulation programming environment for prototyping imaging sensors that are embedded in an imaging system and that are designed for a specific application. And I hope to convince you that image system simulation or what we might call soft prototyping um, will accelerate innovation in the design of imaging sensors and uh, systems, reduce the time and expense for inventing, designing, and optimizing imaging systems for different applications. So the rest of my talk is just details, and you all are, are more than familiar with these details, so um, you can just sit back and enjoy the stories. And uh, the story I'm going to start with was how I got started doing this. Um, so uh, Brian and I started this work in the um, late 90s, and this was around the time when um, Eric Fossum was at uh, JPL and later at Photobit, and Abbas El Gamal was at Stanford, and they were developing the first CMOS imaging sensors. It was really exciting. Um, there were many problems to be solved, and there were many people um, when it originally started, I was at HP Labs, there were many people who didn't think it was going to be possible. We had many uh, very heated discussions about it. Um, and one of the big problems was noise. Some people thought we would never get rid of the noise. Um, and uh, we did, obviously. I mean, they're ubiquitous now, right? And um, people who were working on the circuitry to get rid of the noise were Eric and um, Abbas and many other people. And um, as we were doing this, we were wondering, um, when is that noise no longer visible? When can we say we've solved that problem? There were other problems with the um, CMOS sensor, sensors at that time. I mean, obviously very low resolution and very low dynamic range. Um, and the sensors have come a, a long way since that. Um, but at that time, everything was about design trade-offs. Um, you know, if you make the pixel smaller and smaller to get better resolution, you increase photon noise and, and sensor noise. And so everything was about design trade-offs. And we wanted to put together uh, simulation tools that would allow us to evaluate those design trade-offs. 
And when we started this work, um, there were, there were um, simulation tools available for uh, people. Um, you know, you can use ZMAX and Code 5 for designing lenses, uh, Synopsis and Lumerico for designing photonic structures and semiconductors, and SPICE for um, simulating uh, and designing uh, circuits. But there was no software that put everything together and allowed us to look at the trade-off between the different parts of an imaging system. So, we put together what um, I now call an end-to-end -end image system simulation. Um, it's, um, maybe I should call it beginning-to-end simulation because we begin with a scene. And um, the, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about image quality, the, the quality of the image that a sensor is capturing, you have to consider, first of all, what's the properties of the scene. Then obviously you need to be able to model the optics. Uh, the imaging sensor, you need to implement an image processing pipeline, you need to model the display because that's what we're, um, you're going to be viewing the image on, and then you need to know about um, how the human visual system uh, processes an image. So um, it really takes a team of experts um, from many different disciplines uh, to create an imaging system, such as a digital camera or a camera phone. Um, you need expertise in computer graphics for rendering scenes, optics and photonics, circuits, and, uh, and so on. And as you can see, it really does take a team of people who have expertise in different areas. And so we wanted, again, to put this together so that we could help these teams communicate with one another. And um, one story I'll tell you is that, you know, I was consulting a lot for uh, the first companies that were making the first cell phone cameras, and um, they would often be pu pulled together from different parts of the company. Oh, you know something about optics. Oh, you know something about uh, circuits. And then they'd find themselves on a team, and they had different languages that they used, I mean, ex in terms of their expertise. And then when something went wrong, I, w I might be called in and say, what's wrong with this picture? And it was always, you know, that person, that person. And we, it was really a combination of all these things that was causing the problem. And so originally this tool was really built for them, and I really do think it has helped um, uh, a team of different experts communicate uh, how what they're doing is affecting the final image quality. So um, this is a, a, doing a historical uh, a look. This is the first slide uh, that I gave in 2003 and it describes our first digital camera simulator. Uh, it was work that um, we did with uh, Peter Catrice and Ting Chen, uh, Feng Xiao and, and of course Brian. Uh, Peter Catrice, some of you may know, is uh, now developing color routing sensors at Stanford with Shan Weifan. Um, Ting Chen is leading camera development at Apple. Um, <clears throat> Feng Xiao has started a company called Feng Young Vision to uh, customize in the design of cameras for uh, new applications in healthcare. And Brian and I are still punching away at Stanford um, where we have really enjoyed working with many uh, other talented uh, students and postdocs since we began this work. Um, we called this, uh, when we first started, the Image Systems Engineering Toolbox because we were writing this in MATLAB and um, we were thinking of this as a MATLAB toolbox. Um, at that time, MATLAB did not have object-oriented programming tools the way it has now, but we did think of um, our software in, in those terms, in the sense that a scene was an object, it had data and associated functions, optics is an object, it has um, data and um, calculations, a sensor, um, image processing, and a display. So we actually separated these into different software modules. Um, and at that time um, we started, we started with 2D images, hyperspectral 2D images and test charts. Um, and uh, we modeled, at that time, we modeled point spread functions just uh, calculated from the aperture and the focal length. Um, we could, we designed, um, a lot of the focus was then on predicting the, the um, pixel value. And so that would be determined by the size of the pixel, um, the, um, the, the spectral quantum efficiency, well, the spectral transmissivity of the filter in front of it, um, the color filter array, <clears throat> sensor noise, the exposure time, and so on. So we needed to model all of those things. Um, we implemented a, a, a kind of a uh, image processing pipeline and spent time uh, working with students to teach them about image processing pipelines, and then we rendered it on uh, display. And so to do this, um, 
we really needed all of the data associated with these objects to be represented in physically meaningful units. Uh, so a scene in terms of scene radiance, photons per second per steradian per nanometer per meter square, optics in terms of irradiance, sensor, electrons or volts per pixel, um, image processing, that's pretty easy. Um, then when you display uh, the image on the, um, uh, you need to then again talk about display radiance. So again, we're back into physical units of photons per second steradian per wavelength uh, per meter squared. Um, so um, at the time we also implemented um, a collection of image quality metrics, some of which were already out there in industry, which measure different aspects of uh, image quality. We also uh, played around with uh, designing some of our own, uh, such as predicting when noise is no longer visible. And all of that was um, to kind of quantify different aspects of image quality and to optimize the design of the CMOS imaging center at that time for image quality. So the last 15 years, I would say, of digital photography has focused on optimizing the design in the optics, sensor, uh, image processing, and display in order to generate a nice looking image. But around 2017, we started to work on other applications that also uh, require an accurate uh, image system simulator, but not necessarily a nice looking image. Um, so for example, we wanted to build uh, soft prototypes of new types of imaging sensors for autonomous driving applications. So. We would simulate scenes, um, we, we started to simulate scenes, optic sensors, so that we can generate uh, synthetic uh, camera images that could be used in uh, machine learning. And uh, for um, uh, deep neural networks for detecting objects in a scene. And so again, here now the metric is uh, no longer the metrics of human uh, uh, image quality, but the metric is how well do you do, it's a metric of uh, accuracy of object detection. We also used uh, image system simulations to design cameras for other uses, such as detecting bacteria in the mouth is one of my favorite projects. Um, and I'll say a few words about this, not a lot, but we varied the lights, uh, the filters, and the sensor in simulation so that we could design a camera that could detect the fluorescence emitted uh, by bacteria. And again, the goal was not to produce a pretty picture, it's clearly not a pretty picture, but the goal was to measure the amount and the spatial distribution of bacteria on the tongue. <clears throat> now, there are many applications that would benefit from the development of new types of imaging sensors, um, but here you can see there's a growing market for imaging sensors for automotive and medical imaging, and they really do require new types of imaging sensors, not necessarily the sensor that's in your camera phone. And um, we're so, so again, we're um, assembling the software to, so that people can do the soft prototyping of, of imaging sensors and uh, kind of invent sensors in, in simulation before they're actually built. So uh, this is the outline of the rest of my talk. I'm gonna give you an overview of the physically based image system simulation programming environment that we use. And then I'm gonna tell you a bit about how we, um, assess the accuracy of the simulations, uh, and then I'll tell you how we've used them in our own work, autonomous driving and medical imaging applications. And finally, I'll, I'll tell you how you could download the software, which we hope you will do, and tell us how we can improve it for, so that you could use it. So let's start with this uh, brief overview where I'm going to unpack what we mean by end-to-end -end physics-based image system simulation. So um, our software environment has changed uh, a bit since 2003, but the main components are the same. We need to model the scene in real physical units. We wanna model the physical properties of a 3D scene, including the geometric and the material properties of the objects in the scene. We want to model optics. We wanna be able to trace rays from light um, uh, that's bouncing off of surfaces to the sensor. Uh, after passing through the uh, optical elements. And we want to model how the light is converted once it reaches the surface of the sensor into, uh, into electrons. So um, we're taking advantage of all the progress that's been made in computer graphics, uh, which makes it possible for us to create synthetic and highly realistic 3D scenes. Uh, we use PBRT, which is open source and freely available software package that was developed by 
um, one of our colleagues, Pat Hanrahan, and at Stanford and his former doctoral students, uh, Matt Farr and Greg Humphreys. Uh, PBRT stands for physically based rendering, but I think of it as physically based ray tracing because it uses ray tracing uh, to calculate how light travels through space and is reflected from objects in a 3D scene. Uh, Matt and uh, Greg published the first edition of their software in 2004, and since then it's been uh, continued to be an important resource for uh, many students and researchers, and it certainly has enabled us to st start at the right place where we could represent a scene in physically meaningful units. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, we represent the light in terms of the spectral energy. We trace rays uh, at, at each wavelength from the light to the uh, surface. We model the um, spectral reflectances and in some cases even the, the fluorescence of a surface. Uh, then we trace the ray through the optical elements, through um, the uh, micro lens, through the color filter array, and then uh, calculate the um, sensor irradiance, the, the, the light that's falling on the imaging sensor. And that's what we do uh, in using PBRT. We did make some modifications to make this possible. So um, we implemented um, diffraction. We also use, by the way, I won't talk about this, but we use the same software to model the human eye. So we can model human optics use in, using our software. And then we have a separate piece of software, which I won't talk about, which models how uh, the um, Cone photo detectors absorb light, um, but that's another story. Um, we've um, implemented um, a spherical lenses, micro lens arrays, and we use uh, linear models um, to, uh, for texture maps that control the surface uh, reflectance. And um, again, as I said, we implemented um, fluorescence um, and we um, are modeling uh, other types of media such as underwater uh, imaging, um, water and um, we're getting into thinking of how to simulate fog. Now, if you know the design of a lens, um, you can model the surface and its properties in PBRT and then you can trace um, the path that each ray uh, at each wavelength takes as it travels from the scene uh, to the sensor surface. So just to, that's what ZMAX does, code five, and just to show you that you can do it in PBRT, um, here you can see <coughs> three um, images that represent the uh, sensor irradiance, again, the image falling on the sensor um, for um, after passing through a double gauss, a wide angle, and a fisheye lens. And um, so this is what you can do. Uh, but I should mention when I show pictures like this, it's just a representation. The data behind this is actually a series of images where each image is the intensity at a particular wavelength. So we are representing um, the spectral radiance. Um, <clears throat> but what happens when you don't know the lens design? And that's typically the case that people, companies, it doesn't matter whether you're Google or Facebook, the lens manufacturer is not going to tell you their lens design. That is proprietary information. So how do you model a uh, camera when you don't know that? Um, well, um, I want to highlight the work that Thomas Goosens has done. He's a postdoc working with us, and uh, he, he solved this problem for us. Um, and um, the way he did this was to develop uh, uh, basically a, what we call a ray transfer function. So company, uh, if you're using software like ZMAX where you've specified the lens design, um, a company doesn't have to share with you the lens design. They can share with you what they call a black box model. And that black box model tells you the lens coming in, I mean the rays coming in and the rays exiting. You don't get to know what happened in between, but they will tell you the rays coming in and the rays coming out. That's called a black box model. And with that, you can build a ray transfer function, just a function that you can sit inside of PBRT. And um, uh, the way uh, uh, Thomas implemented this was um, using a set of polynomials, and each set of polynomials, again, is parameterized by wavelength. Uh, so we, so this is very, um, you can do, you want to represent all the wavelengths that are in the scene passing through the, um, the lens. And just to show an example, here um, is an example, the two images here, one is uh, where the lens prescription is known, so inside of PBRT it was modeled with the known lens design. And then uh, the, the image on your um, right-hand side 
was uh, modeled um, using the um, ray transfer function um, that we got from the black box for that, um, uh, or we, that we generated for that uh, lens. And uh, below, you can, and, and there's a, you can see a line passing through. And so you, for, for one particular wavelength, for example, you can plot um, the uh, intensity uh, going across uh, the horizontal line in the middle of the uh, image. And um, we're comparing uh, that line with the lens prescription and the one with the RTF, and you can see they, they fall on top of one another. You can just see red because red falls on top of the blue line. So um, this was a way of validating that this really did work. So um, <clears throat> we use PBRT again to uh, build physically meaningful um, representations of 3D scenes and we model how light is transmitted, reflected and even emitted. Um, and we do this so that we can calculate the light that's falling on the imaging sensor. And um, then we use a separate piece of software which we call ISIC CAM. And this um, calculates the um, pixel values um, after uh, modeling the filter transmissivities of the sensor array, the pixel size, the sensor noise, and many other properties, exposure duration. Um, and um, I'm not going to go into this, but I realize maybe I should, but you can uh, get the software off the web and I encourage you to, to play with this as well. Um, we, we have done a lot of validation on this uh, and it was kind of uh, the original work was a lot on focusing on how you can model different types of imaging sensors. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. The, again, the software is on GitHub. You just have to do a search on ISET and you could um, use, use it as you want. Um, but I, I do want to tell you about how we um, quantify the accuracy of the simulations because it's very important for us to be able, and for you to be able to trust that the simulations are, are reasonable. So I'm going to tell you about one way in which we've done this. We've done this uh, many different ways, but this way is kind of compelling. Um, <clears throat> so here you might recognize the um, Cornell box. Um, one is a real box that was captured with a real camera and one is the simulated box that was captured with the simulated camera. And uh, we did this uh, at the beginning of COVID. It was easy to build. Uh, the, it's just a box with uh, uh, diffusely reflecting uh, matte paper, red paper on one wall, green paper on the other wall, the rest of it is blue. We have at the top of the uh, camera uh, light that's illuminating it, we have the boxes. We put in the Stanford Bunny and we also did a 3D printing of the Stanford Bunny and we put in a miniature um, um, uh, Macbeth color checker. And these were simple things that were, that was possible to simulate. So um, here I think you can see, oh, I, I should mention that this is work that uh, Zhang Lu is doing as part of his uh, doctoral thesis at Stanford. And um, you can see that um, we've, plant, we've plotted uh, some simulated uh, RGB values against uh, some measured RGB values and we get a nice line. I'm going to go into a little bit more, a little more of the quantitative um, measurements that we made. But here's a, here I am um, with a, a Google Pixel 4a camera um, <clears throat> and uh, taking a picture. Uh, here's the Google box. We did a lot of calibration. You can see the light at the top that's coming down. Um, the red wall, the green wall, and you can see we've measured the spectral power of the light and the uh, spectral reflectance of the um, uh, uh, wall surfaces. As, um, and of course, we knew this, we measured the spectral reflectance as a Macbeth color checker. <clears throat> and then we captured uh, images of this box. And um, just to go through, um, when we wanted to do the simulation, we um, simulated the uh, geometric you know, uh, aspects and, of the, and the position of the camera, the position of the light um, using Cinema 4D, but you know, now we use Blender, so all of that's possible. Um, and then we measured the spectral properties of the light, the surfaces, et cetera, as I mentioned. We input that data into PBRT in, other, in order to do the um, spectral-based ray tracing. <clears throat> where we implemented a ray transfer function of the Google Pixel 4a camera. So we were able to get a black box model from the people at Google, thank you very much. And um, we were able to build a ray trace function and um, generate uh, the, um, and then run it through our 
a camera simulator and so that we could then get a synthetic camera image. So um, here um, we are, um, our goal was to match the raw camera output. We were not trying to wa match the processed image. Obviously uh, Google wasn't gonna tell us how they generated um, their processed image data and they of course generated a ni very nice looking image but we're just trying to gener uh, look at the raw sensor value. And so the renderings are gonna be shown with the sensor values. All we did was bilinear demosaicing. So again, qualitatively, I think you can see um, the similarity is pretty good. Um, you know, similar high dynamic range. You can see shadows, you can see the inner reflections. Um, so this is great, um, but of course, we want to be able to quantify this difference. And so we did some examples, like for example, here's, we took this little miniature uh, Macbeth color checker and put it in different locations. And you, if it's in the um, location on your left-hand side, it would reflect more red light. And if it's on the right, it would reflect more green light in the middle. It would, so we wanted to be able to measure inner reflections. And um, so we captured um, an image with a Google Pixel camera. And we um, compared, uh, let's say we're gonna go uh, take a, a line through the uh, gray uh, pixel uh, the, 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 we look at the pixel values for the gray uh, uh, portion of the Macbeth color checker and you can just kind of plot how it uh, goes down in pixel values. And um, we do this both for the uh, simulated or the synthetic and the real uh, camera image and you can see that um, we do a very good job um, uh, predicting those uh, pixel values. Um, and, um, and you can also see that for both the synthetic and the, the simulated and the real, um, you obviously the ratio of red to green is much higher here and, than it is on the um, right-hand side. So we do um, capture all the inner reflections. <clears throat> and um, uh, so again, the main point is to um, show that uh, we can predict the effect of these surface inner reflections and, what they, and the effect that they will have on the digital values. We also did some optics validations. Um, so here we sh you can see we have two uh, targets uh, that have a slanted edge on them. We have this both in the real and the synthetic uh, and simulated. And you can see that when the camera is focused at three meters, um, the, um, let's see if I can, you can see this, yeah, when the camera is focused at three meters, you can see that uh, the uh, line spread function, which is derived from uh, this line here, the line spread function is, is much sharper than when um, it's, uh, than the line that's at five meters. And conversely, when you um, focus at five meters, the um, line spread function is much sharper for five meters and than it is for at the three meter. But the important point is that the simulated and the real camera data uh, superimpose, that they both have show the, the similar type of depth of focus and blur. So this tests um, both the, um, the scene, our representation of the scene, uh, as well as the lens in the uh, Google Pixel 4a camera. Um, we also compared um, now, you can get the, when to do this kind of modeling of an imaging sensor, the sensor manufacturer will give you uh, con quantum efficiency or you can measure it yourself. And so um, what we show here is um, you can predict what the uh, 24 surfaces, uh, what the RGB values would be for the 24 surfaces on the Beth color checker. And um, you, um, uh, given the um, spectral quantum efficiency, the quantum efficiency here is including both the CMOS sensor photo detector quantum efficiency and the uh, RGB color filters. And um, so here on the bottom left, you'll see the, um, the, the data that the uh, manufacturer tells us and you can, and you can see that um, you um, don't do a, a great job um, predicting the um, measured data but you can do a simple three by three correction. You can find a three by three correction and we can do a much better uh, correct um, prediction. And that's just representing uh, the crosstalk that, that is not, um, and any ga changes in gain that the sensor manufacturer won't tell you or, or is unique to this camera. 
Um, <clears throat> finally, we also did some measurements of noise. So you can see these little sample points all over. We sampled the noise. And for each sample, we calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So here we're plotting uh, the standard deviation against the mean value. And you can see when we did this both for the simulated and the measured uh, that we got very similar. Um, so the simulated is shown in, um, in red and the uh, real data are shown in blue. And the fact that they're uh, close to one another validates our sensor model, our sensor noise model, I should say. So um, again, so the, we do validation studies like this. I wanted to show you this one because, uh, you know, you can see something and you can see also the quantitative measurements um, and it helps uh, us and I hope you also feel like, you, you know, you can trust these simulations. So now just uh, how have we used these tools? Well, um, we have used um, these, this to work on a number of different applications. Uh, digital photography, of course, we did actually um, invent a, uh, or uh, a new type of image processing pipeline which we explored using uh, the simulations. We um, <clears throat> simulated surround video. We um, actually developed a uh, multispectral flash for underwater imaging which we talked about in I, uh, ICCP in 2017 uh, and that was using uh, the simulation software, a combination of simulation and then actually building it. And then I'll just give you two examples in medical imaging and autonomous driving now. And um, the medical imaging one was again done with Zheng Lu and um, Feng Xiao and Brian and myself. And um, this was, what we did was um, come up with a 3D model. We used 3D model of the uh, mouth and we measured tissue reflectance of the tongue. We're primarily interested in the tongue, so we measured tissue reflectance of the tongue and we measured uh, uh, light specter where we're varying different types of light. We were interested in fluorescence and so we would um, model the excitation emission matrix of different tissue fluorophores. In this case, we're interested in bacteria. So the uh, be a tissue uh, excitation emission matrix, uh, porphyrins. We did look at other tissue fluorophores as well, but the one that comes out really clearly is bacteria. And um, we model optics and calculated sensor image. And um, Again, you know, placing the light uh, in the position of the camera um, and all of, all of this to um, uh, calculate the uh, sensor values that we would get. And we were varying the filters in front of the light and the filters that we needed to place in front of the camera uh, so that we could uh, get the best signal. And um, we did all of this in simulation and then we asked Fang Young Vision to build this camera for us. So you can see here uh, this is uh, Brian and <laughs> you can see his, him sticking out his tongue and here's the camera. Uh, we wore goggles to shield ourselves from the um, blue light. Uh, we did this in the dark obviously because fluorescence is a very weak signal but I had to take these pictures, here's me sticking out my tongue. So um, this is our a representation of simulated and uh, real uh, uh, camera. And, um, data and so at the top is our data that we captured from uh, ourselves and a volunteer um, and you can see one of the per people there has a lot of bacteria on his tongue and this really happens if you eat lunch and then take a picture of your tongue with the blue light and turn off all the lights, take a picture, you'll see a very red signal and um, <clears throat> so you can see that this, this was taken after somebody had lunch, had a lot of bacteria on his tongue, so we're looking at the red fluorescence. The green, it would be um, fluorescence that's due to other tissue fluorophores, uh, the teeth. Um, and um, the way we did this matching was uh, we would rotate the camera model so that we could, you know, um, get the same kind of uh, aspect ratio. And, uh, and then we did a match, so in the case in the middle, of course, we were matching uh, the spatial distribution of the um, bacteria. And uh, so to, to show that, um, you know, what we were capturing was the fluorescence of the bacteria. And the simulated again was based on the excitation emission matrix C's for uh, porphyrins. Um, I, I won't talk any more about this, but there is paper and we went into some quantitative measurements and there was a reason why we were interested in, in this um, and to get quantitative measurements. Um, the other <clears throat> example is autonomous driving 
And this is work that Jen Yi Lu um, has done for both his um, doctoral thesis and now he's working with us as a postdoc. Um, and um, here we wanted to simulate uh, new types of imaging sensors for autonomous driving. And our goal is to design and evaluate new types of imaging sensors. Uh, we want to generate synthetic camera image data and then train neural networks uh, and evaluate network performance as a function of the camera design. Uh, now, another use of synthetic camera images, and it's being widely used now. Um, as you can see here, some of the camera, some of the companies that are, are generating synthetic camera images. Tesla is also, they're just not listed here, but you can imagine why you want to do that as a way of augmenting your database. You'll want to simulate uh, dangerous driving conditions that you don't are well represented in your um, in your real database, and um, it enables you to um, uh, simulate different uh, lighting conditions. So, <clears throat> um, this is a partial list of companies that are doing this. Um, and many of them are talking about uh, sensor simulation, but I think there's only one that I know of right now, which is Anyverse, which is doing what uh, we would consider really uh, 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 simulating the sensor. But hopefully more and more will uh, start to do that. Um, and again, but our goal for doing this is because we want to design new types of imaging sensor uh, uh, and do, build a soft prototype. Um, uh, these other companies are doing it because they want to augment their um, database. So you can see that um, it's just not practical if you want to design a new uh, imaging sensor to what you'd have to, to, to use the sort of typical product lifecycle where you design it, you build it, you put it on the camera, you drive it around, then you have to label all the images, and then you have to uh, see how well it uh, performs. It doesn't do very well, you go back. It's just um, 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 not a practical way. Um, I guess summarizing that, uh, an empirical design build, test, uh, repeat product life cycle is um, impractical for the co-design of imaging systems and neural networks. So uh, we believe uh, soft prototyping using physically accurate uh, image system simulations can reduce the time and expense of designing, uh, inventing, designing, evaluating uh, new types of imaging sensors. So uh, we, uh, I've been using, put together an infrastructure for doing this, so this is a simulated um, image, you could see Vista Lab 2018, 2018 was when we did this one. And um, it's, it's just a representation, again, this is actually, um, we are representing, for example, here you can see this little dot here, we are representing the spectral reflectance or the spectral radiance, so that's a, it's a function of the, the light that's coming down and the spectral reflectance. We're, we're representing the spectral radiance of uh, all the parts in the scene, uh, so it shows you the red on the fire truck, the um, uh, other parts of uh, blue on this um, uh, van, the, um, the green in the trees, et cetera. And uh, this is just a representation of a raw sensor image for uh, your typical RGB uh, uh, color filter array. Many other types of imaging sensors that are being used now um, are um, the... Um, uh, YCC, which is shown here, this is a very popular one that's being used um, for um, in the imaging sensors for autonomous driving. Um, <clears throat> the representation of uh, RGBW, which is a sensor that we've um, done a little bit of simulation with, so you could show what the, um, the you can predict the sensor data for that type of uh, sensor array. And of course, uh, one of the nice things, and this is a, another reason why companies are interested in the synthetic data is that um, all the objects are automatically labeled. So you'd have no hand labeling. And in fact, um, I, I know that Tesla's doing a lot more synthetic work and working out ways to do automatic labeling. They've laid off a lot of the people who do hand uh, labeling for them now because um, uh, they're, they're finding more efficient ways to do that. Um, when, um, and obviously a synthetic um, camera images have the advantage in that they're already uh, hand labeled and you can get a depth map. Um, okay, so now you might ask, um, we've generated these uh, synthetic camera images, can you um, uh, replace or substitute synthetic camera images for real camera images? And so we did uh, some studies on that. Well, Jen Li, uh, Jen, 
uh, Jen Yi did this work, uh, where um, we took um, synthetic uh, camera image uh, data that was generated by Cynthia. Now Cynthia is a raster-based um, uh, graphics uh, method, so that's, it's not ray tracing. Uh, Synscape is based on ray tracing but does not represent the, uh, does not simulate the imaging sensor and then we're calling ours ISA Auto which incorporates a ray tracing and all the things I told you about before as well as the sensor model. And the idea is that you want to train on the synthetic data and test on real data and see how well it generalizes. So here's an example. Um, that shows that um, compares Cynthia, Synscape, and Isodato. So when you, you train on the synthetic data and you test on the um, real data, and you can see that um, Isodato does um, better than the other two methods. Um, ray tracing does better than rasters because obviously you're taking into account um, uh, more, uh, it's more physically uh, meaningful representation of a scene. Um, of course, um, when you add in um, uh, um, the sensor model, um, it, 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 it improves the generalization. But um, you also might think, well, generalization is imperfect among real data sets as well, so it's good to kind of calibrate yourself if I was to train on the um, Kitty database and test on the BDD database or the Cityscape database, um, how well it, would it generalize? And you can see it does not generalize very well. Um, I, first of all, I should point out um, training within the same, training on the Kitty database, testing on the Kitty database does always does better. Train on the BDD, test on the BDD. On the diagonals, you'll see that it always is better to train on the, um, and test on the same database. And that um, these um, uh, databases, uh, CNNs trained on these um, have differ in terms of how they um, um, generalize. And again, I want to point out that Kitty uh, does not generalize well, and you might ask why is that? And um, the Kitty uh, RGB database came from one camera. So they took one camera and they went around and captured images, whereas the BDD uh, RGB database came from many different cameras. Um, and so, um, tr so th that's one reason. And uh, with Cityscape, we, we don't even know what the camera is. We know a little bit about the camera for the kitty. So we did our best guess at trying to simulate it. Um, our best guess was, well, what's a popular uh, our sensor that's out there? So we, we used kind of the um, uh, an on semiconductor sensor that was very popular and we uh, modeled that as our sensor and we um, then um, trained on um, ICID Auto tested on um, the various different um, uh, real databases and you can see that we do um, better at predicting Kitty than we do uh, on the other um, ones. And I think that what I want you to take away from this is that it's best to train on neural networks um, on, that are um, on synthetic camera image data that model the real camera image data. That's definitely what you want to do. Um, of course, you want to evaluate um, generalization for both measured and synthetic data. Also, you want to think about things like scene statistics. If you train on images in the day, they do not transfer or generalize to uh, uh, predicting um, object detection at night. You train on different sensor parameters, and we have shown this, we have a number of papers showing this, that the sensor parameters matter too. So if you change the sensor parameters, you lose on um, uh, generalization. Um, and we've also looked at different exposure algorithms. So these things really do matter uh, in terms of, um, and here's an example um, just to, to show that even on real uh, camera data, so BDD has day, uh, uh, separated theirs into day and night, and if you train on uh, the day and then you uh, test at night, um, you, you'll do much worse. So, um, and now this may be obvious uh, to you, but it illustrates the importance of simulating uh, different lighting conditions, um, headlight glare, different types of lights, etc. cetera, um, <clears throat> uh, lighting day and night, different weather conditions and uh, driving, dri dangerous driving scenarios and et cetera. 
Um, just to show you, um, we are starting to um, model uh, low light levels and um, we have, and now we're looking at detection of what we call vulnerable uh, road users or VRU, uh, that's a term that people use. So you're a VRU, you're a vulnerable road user and we're looking at how uh, detection of that is um, uh, as a function of the, the lighting conditions. Uh, here you can show, you can see that in our simulation, this is simulation, uh, we model the, um, uh, the radiance that's coming from uh, this part of the scene. Um, and you can see here that the spectral properties of this uh, headlight is different from the spectral properties of this headlight and, and there's a lot of variety in the spectral properties of these different lights. Um, and here's the um, spectral um, light, the light that's being reflected off of the uh, deer, which is a vulnerable road user. And uh, here I show you um, uh, an image that um, uh, is generated with the RGB. Uh, this is again the real pop, oh, this is a RGBW. Uh, this is a YMCK uh, uh, sensor, which you're gonna be hearing some about for autonomous driving. And this is the YCC, which is a very popular uh, sensor that's being used now. And again, just to show you, these are uh, the synthetic, so it's automatically labeled and, um, and you get the depth map. Uh, and, oh, and I, th these are an example with, we're starting to play around with the difference of camera flare, which not everybody would simulate and it is important to simulate camera flare. And uh, so we're doing different types of um, simulations to expand and to look at how these things um, affect uh, uh, the performance of a, a neural network. So um, I wanna leave you with uh, one example of how uh, you can use the simulation to invent new types of imaging sensors <clears throat> using simulation. And uh, this project was inspired by the assertion of, by Elon Musk that LIDAR was not necessary. And there's been a lot of debate in industry about the value of depth information for deep neural networks for object detection. And um, well, so what we decided to do is look at this a bit in simulation. It turns out that if you match the, if you have a depth sensor and you match it with the same resolution and as an RGB imaging sensor, that depth will do slightly better, which was a surprise to me. Um, so depth information is, is highly valuable. Um, and, and the reason it doesn't do as well as with RGB today is because it has lower spatial resolution. So that gave us the idea, well, what if we combine the radiance and the um, uh, depth information on the same sensor? So the way we did this in simulation was to take the, an RGB image and take the blue pixel value, the blue channel, and replace it with the depth information. So we have an RGD, which is shown below here. And just to illustrate that, uh, you can see um, that um, the, 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 in the blue channel, uh, the depth information is showing you the blue red, you can see the, the difference in the color for blue red and that's representing the depth information. So we create this sensor, we send it through a uh, ResNet and we uh, uh, say, you know, do the best job at uh, predicting the uh, uh, cars in the scene. And um, when you do that, you could see that um, the RGD, RG and D for depth does better than the RGB. Um, and also I'm showing here that if you just do depth alone and you don't match for resolution, you don't do as well. So um, we also simulated this using real camera data. So uh, Waymo has a data set that you can get out where they um, give you both RGB and LiDAR. And so we used that data, uh, combined it to make an RGD sensor and we also found the same thing that we, um, there is an advantage of uh, replacing the blue channel or incorporating the um, depth into the sensor. Now, you might think, uh, well, that's all very nice. You made a, an imaging sensor, great idea, but nobody's ever built that. And I was really happy to discover that there is a patent, um, has Eric Fossum on the patent, and he did this when he was working at Samsung. And they do combine uh, depth with radiance. Um, they use a um, time of flight, uh, a gated CMOS time of flight, 
uh, pixel, and they do it on the same sensor array. And you can imagine one of the advantages of doing that is that it has solved the problem, a very important problem of, in sensor fusion, which is aligning irradiance and depth information. So uh, the patent is out there and maybe there'll be other ideas, but I did want to show one example of how in simulation you can uh, demonstrate the, uh, an idea and how uh, simulate an imaging sensor that's not built, predict how, how it will perform. And the last idea I want to leave you with is um, that um, sometimes when you're creating a new imaging system, you solve a hard problem. So let's, I think the RGD is interesting because it does solve a, um, not only is there an advantage of it, it performs better than RGB, but it solves the sensor fusion problem. And um, I'm recollecting and remembering when I was working at uh, HP Labs, you, you might remember those times being where um, we're all working on half-toning methods and, you know, uh, trying to push that envelope and then along comes high resolution printers and nobody's working on half toning methods anymore because you don't need to, you know. Um, you could say the same thing about um, cameras. We worked a lot on demosaicing algorithms, there were lots of clever algorithms out there for demosaicing. Along comes high resolution sensors. Bilinear interpolation is fine. So, um, I, I guess what I want to say there is that there is some value in thinking about how you can solve a problem by designing a new imaging sensor and um, we are hoping that um, more of you will be doing that. And, um, and just to remind you I, I described the software to simulate imaging sensors and these sensors are embedded in an imaging system so this is an end-to-end -end physics based image system simulation. I showed you how we're using it in our own work and and I hope I convinced you that um, this uh, environment could help uh, advance uh, uh, innovation in the design of imaging sensors and systems and reduce the time and expense uh, in designing new sensors for, for different applications. And so I'll leave you with um, my urging of you to use the software. Uh, we have found it very beneficial in our teaching and in our research and we're hoping that it will be useful to you as well. So the software is on GitHub and uh, so you can download it, you can send us email, you can ask us questions, you can come hang out with us at Stanford, so if you have a question, just come down the hall. Um, we really do want at this point um, to uh, have it be used for many other different applications and I hope, I hope you'll find some of it useful. And, um, and again, I wanna thank the people who um, contributed to, uh, to this work. And uh, thank you for um, listening. Uh, thanks so much. I, I noticed a lot of cameras recording that next to the last slide, so that's good. Oh, uh, with, good, with good, the, good, yeah. <laughs> I really do, contact us, don't be shy. Um, uh, are there questions? Uh, Thank you, Josh, for such an amazing talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One, a bit cherry picking uh, regarding the noise simulation that you have shown, where it matches the sensor noise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering how uh, uh, you have modeled noise in the rendering process. Is it simply like adding a Gaussian noise kind of a thing, or is it? How, uh, how it was the question? How did we implement and simulate yes. noise? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, okay, so uh, photon noise, obviously, we, we simulate that. And then um, we have um, different types of noise. So there's what they call DSNU, dark signal noise uniformity, and um, that's the dark signal and how it varies across the sensor array. And then there's a photoreceptor non-uniformity, that's the difference in the gain across pixels on an array. Um, so we model, we empirically measure that, and in our paper, um, we describe how to um, and, and measure that and we've had students do that as a homework exercise. It's very easy uh, to, um, uh, you know, capture that data because that is, and that's what we use in our Google Pixel 4a because, you know, the sensor manufacturer is not going to tell you what their noise properties are. Uh, and, um, yeah, is that, is that? Yeah, so basically you add it as a post-processing after the rendering is completed on the data you do like post addition and then sensor noise addition, is it? I'm sorry, I didn't get so, it. Sorry. Uh, once you render the image, you add post noise and you add the 
sensor noise by randomly sampling from the statistics yeah, that you have measured? Yeah, we calculate the sensor pixel values and then we add noise to the sensor pixel values. It's all done on, um, in units of electrons or volts. Thank you. Sure. Um, another quick question maybe. Uh, I see a lot of people there, so sorry about that. Um, like most of the uh, PBRT, it's ray model of light, but we have like other models like wave-based models and uh, EM model or quant mm -hmm. quantum model. And uh, yeah, most of the uh, examples that you have shown, it doesn't show up the wave effects, except maybe the fluorescence imaging that you have shown. Wait, can you get closer? I'm having yeah, a hard time sorry, hearing. I I, no, 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 you get closer to the microphone. I'm just, my hearing is not as great. So go ahead. Okay, can you hear me better now? I can't tell what? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, uh, I was saying, uh, the higher models of light, like wave or uh, EM or other higher order models of light, can we? Uh, how can we add them to the simulation, like uh, to the rendering engine or to the end? So, for oh, example, how would you, do you use other models into the? Sorry. Yeah, so if I have like a coherent light source, oh, if okay. I'm doing fluorescence imaging. Uh, and it's a spatially coherent source, so I get speckle or other effects. Yes. So uh, how, how do you envision Oh, how do I envision that in, in PBRT or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, good question. I'm glad you asked it, and I'm um, sorry it took me so long to hear it, but um, uh, some of these things can be represented with ray optics, and uh, some maybe we'll have to move towards uh, wave optics. And uh, this is an area that Thomas Goosens is um, exploring, and so I would, if you're interested, in, I encourage you to contact him. He would love to hear from you. And um, uh, he's now thinking about, you know, when a ray arrives at some place, like a very small uh, micro lens or something, at that point a ray is coming in at a particular angle, so you can think of that as the orientation of a plane. And so now we go to uh, plane optics and, and then from there use uh, wave optics. Um, so he's experimenting with that and that will be added in um, so that, and we makes, think it will be necessary for, okay. yeah. That makes sense. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Joyce. Great talk. Um, just following up, I think, on those questions, um, in general, what aspects do you think are missing from the current simulation? Um, things that might come to mind to me are also maybe sensor-based effects like yes. crosstalk or angle of incidence effects or other electronic effects. Um, and then second question, um, what about speed? Uh, these methods, do you think, um, oh. you know, you're modeling a lot of things, is it uh, possible to get it up to speed where you can, you know, compute millions of images effectively? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, ray tracing, uh, large scenes, uh, takes a lot of um, CPU, and uh, Matt Farr has done some great things to, P, uh, to PBRT so that we can speed this up now using GPUs. So. It's going a lot faster, but um, it's not something I would ask uh, an undergraduate to spend a lot of time doing. So um, our thought is that we will, um, uh, we have a vision of what we want to do. Uh, you know, the idea would be that there would be a database of these um, uh, sense, uh, scene radiance images, and from there you could add on um, so we want to save people as much time as possible. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of um, uh, generating of these uh, scenes and we're working with a company that's got much more CPU uh, power than we do, uh, G GPU, um, and they have a much bigger system um, and much more money and they're, they're cranking it out on, you know, thousands of images that you need for training a neural network for autonomous driving. So. It's, it's, yeah, I, I recognize that problem and we're thinking of how to make it easy for people. Um, on the other hand, you know, something like the, um, the medical application, you know, I could do that myself, so. Um, and then um, the other question was... On mi missing aspects missing? of modeling. Yes. That's, um, so crosstalk is a very good example. Um, you could think of what the first thing with the Google Pixel 4 is, kind of a low frequency type of model where we did model crosstalk, but it was through a three by three and we measured it empirically. But when you're getting down to where you guys are really interested in, um, at the level of a, a filter on top of a pixel and um, uh, maybe a, a underneath a, a, a 
micro lens and there's a lot of them, you know, then you're in the nanophotonics area or something. So there, um, that area is, that is what uh, Thomas is going to be exploring and he's going to be using these wave optics. MEEP is what he's starting with, but he'll be doing, you know, that, that's, that's, that's definitely something we need to be able to um, model um, these new types of pixels that are coming out for, yeah, autofocus. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. These are the last four of you in line. I'm so sorry. I think we should um, break to, to lunch now, but uh, I, I, you'll be here to answer oh, some I'm questions. I'm around. I'm so, so around. Just, we'll take them offline. And um, let's uh, show our thanks oh. for Joyce one thanks. more time. Thank you so much.